Okay? Along with dozens, maybe hundreds of other people from all over the world. Today, as usual, we're going to talk about startups. This is my favorite hour of the month, honestly. Uh, talking to all of you inspiring, optimistic, productive people who've got ideas about how they're going to change the world. It's going to be a great time, and I hope that uh, you're going to join us, whether you're joining us on uh, YouTube or LinkedIn Live or Facebook or Blog Talk Radio, wherever you are, welcome. We're going to turn on the chat room here in a minute, and we're happy to take your questions. And I'd love to hear where you're from. That's always interesting to me, at least. If you are uh, just tuning in, Please let me know um, that you can hear me and see me, especially those of you backstage like Ella and Troy and some other folks. If you can give me a thumbs up, that would be very helpful. Thank you there. Uh, just to know that this works because oftentimes it doesn't because it's the Internet. So you're here today to join me. I'm Scott Fox. I'm the CEO of the Startup Council, also an experienced angel investor, uh, serial Internet entrepreneur, author of these books uh, over here behind me. Well, at least the three in the middle. I wrote those. Those are in English. The others are in, uh, let's see, uh, Russian and Turkish and Japanese and Polish and a bunch of other languages. So if you're here from overseas today, nice to meet you. I hope that uh, my books have been helpful to you as well. What we're going to do today is talk about your questions. And this is my favorite part of the month, like I said, because I never know what you're going to say. <laughs> Some of you have been nice enough to send in your questions in advance, and we will definitely cover those. Uh, thanks to those of you who RSVP'd via Eventbrite or the other forums we have online. And the rest of you, well, you're welcome to join me as well. We just put up the URL right there there um, that shows where you can come uh, on camera. Uh, so if you're ready to turn on your webcam and want to talk to me live, that would be great. Happy to meet you and help you if we can. Um, and uh, while we're at it, please invite your friends, right? This is a community service. This is free. Uh, you're going to get the benefit of my decades of, of expertise, uh, raising money and spending money and losing money and making money all in the context of entre entrepreneurship. Uh, I, I left, um, I graduated from Stanford in the middle 90s, and a lot of us did go onto the internet, no surprise, and a lot of money was made. Um, and that's uh, the basis of my books, basically, uh, as well as my career. And these days, I'm more of an angel investor. I don't start companies as much as I used to, uh, but I invest in companies. So I've been on both sides of the table. So what we do here each month during startup office hours is try to help you figure out how you can get from where you are, uh, well, honestly, to a little more where I am <laughs> on this side of the microphone uh, with the checkbook. That's the goal. And if I can be helpful to you, that would be fantastic. We also have people here joining us in the chat room who are my friends or investors from around the world, uh, as well as lots of different uh, helpful service providers and experts who can help you. We often have attorneys or accountants or different service providers here. So I encourage all of you to get going in the chat room. That's over on LinkedIn. You can comment there or you can uh, post on YouTube. Let's actually, let's go ahead and turn that chat room on. Let's see here. Another button for me. Okay, here we go. So here's the chat room. This will start flowing into our visuals here in a moment. And look forward to seeing you uh, in there. Let me know what you want to talk about because we're here to take your questions. I don't have an agenda particularly other than to try to help you. I founded the Startup Council. Actually, quick promo for that. The Startup Council over here. It looks like I cut off the URL, but you can probably figure it out startupcouncil.org. This is a free community service I started several years ago to try to bring founders together to connect them more quickly to resources. Why? Well, honestly, I, I'm fed up with the gatekeeping that goes on in Silicon Valley. A lot of us in Silicon Valley benefited by being in the right place at the right time. And it didn't hurt, obviously, that I was white and male at the right place at the right time. I worked hard, but all of those things contributed to a place where I can give back through programs like this. And that's what the Startup Council is. It's a directory, a set of services um, with the objective of making and finding investors more transparent and easier for you, for connecting with co-founders and team members easier and tra more transparent for you, and finding the service providers that you need as well, the attorneys, the accountants, the consultants, the HR folks, all the recruiters, all those folks that uh, you need help from to grow a company. And um, that's what the Startup Council is. So if you're not on the mailing list there, you can join for free. It's free. <laughs> Startupcouncil.org. My effort to try to bring everybody together and, you know, get this kind of mob scene organized into a parade that will help us all uh, succeed more and improve the world. I have to uh, apologize today. I have a bit of a cold. You might hear my voice is a bit scratchy. And after talking for an hour or so in the next few minutes, it's probably going to get worse. So I'm sorry about that, but I'm um, doing the best I can here. So uh, let's say hi to the folks who've joined us so far. So if you're in the chat room, um, let me know where you're from. Be happy to hear 
uh, some comments. There's Zach. Hi, Zach. Nice to see you. Hit the thumbs up. Yes, thank you, Zach. Please do click like and subscribe uh, and follow depending on what platform you're on. I'd love to hear what platform you're on also, because like I said, we're on YouTube live, LinkedIn live, Facebook, uh, blog talk radio. If, let's make sure all those are working because if nothing's happening <laughs> on one of those, I might have to pause for a second and go hit some buttons. Uh, Jasper is a seasoned UX designer. Great. Where are you from, Jasper? Like, nice to meet you. Uh, Roderick, nice to see you as well. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Orlando, Florida. There we go. Chicago, Illinois. Uh, tuning in. I know there's some of you from overseas. Southern California. Good. Who's from? Who's here from the Northern Virginia? Hi, Tori. Uh, Hubert. There's Hubert from Hong Kong. That's good. Hey, everybody. So keep letting us know. Brea. All right. Southern California in the house. LA. Um, okay. And here come some questions as well. DC. Excellent. Ben Amzaminian, founder of Meetnik from LA. Okay. And uh, Chan. Cool. All right. India. There we go. Thank you, Shantanu. So somebody's up in the middle of the night. Thank you, Shantanu. All the way from India. India and from Seattle. Good. Okay. So we got a full house here. Uh, Randy from Long Beach. Nice to see you again. And Kirk, you're on Restream. Okay. You're directly here. If anybody's on, looks like we've got YouTube and looks like everybody's on YouTube so far. Is anybody on LinkedIn or is it not working on LinkedIn? That would be concerning. And I'd appreciate knowing that if you can tell me. Florian from Switzerland, Antonio on Facebook. Great. Um, let's see, Phoenix, very nice. Okay, so enough, I'll get back to that. Um, I'm just, hold on, I just wanna know that we've got somebody from LinkedIn because if they're not, I just need to click a few more buttons here, but I'll give you guys a chance to react on that. Um, Actually, you know what, I'm going to, sorry guys, let me go check on LinkedIn myself. If none of you are there, probably easier for me to get there than the rest of you. Let's see. Let's see, it says it's live. Yep, there, I see myself talking. That's my, <laughs> okay, good enough. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Okay, so time for your questions. So we're going to get on with this and we're going to talk about what you want to talk about. So the idea here is if you have questions well, about startup businesses. I've done a lot of different things. Like I said, I've been on both sides of the table as an investor more recently, and then also as a founder many times. I invest in companies and I help them raise money. Um, so I do these things. I do a lot of public speaking. Actually, if you're looking for keynote speakers or that sort of thing at events that you're aware of, let me know about that. Uh, for example, I'll be speaking at the Global Entrepreneurship Congress in Melbourne next month. Uh, and that's in Australia. Um, talking about how non-U.S. companies can enter the U.S. markets. So if that's a topic that's of interest to you, you should go to the Global Entrepreneurship Congress in Melbourne, Florida. It's a long flight for a lot of us, but especially if you're in, in, Australia, in Australia anyway, that's going to be a great show. Um, and if you have questions like that kind of thing, like how do I get from here to there? That's what I'm here to try to help you with is to connect the dots that help you raise money and build your teams and find growth and product market fit faster. All right. So let me do a couple quick, um, couple quick disclaimers, and then we'll get to your questions. So let's see. Here's the first one. Uh, free membership. So yeah, head over to Startup Council and join us there. Um, I should mention our sponsor. We have a great sponsor, Cake Equity. CakeEquity.com. These are good friends of mine. I invested in this company. I like it so much. That's what their logo looks like. CakeEquity.com is useful to all of you, and this is why I invested is because every founder that's gonna grow a venture-backed company needs to manage their capitalization table and to give out stock options to their team. That's what Cake does. And they do it in really uh, friendly, easy to use, cheap format. This is like Carta, but way cheaper and more global since a lot of us have um, you know, contractors and friends and whatever overseas, they will manage it on a global basis, very inexpensively. And if you use that link, you get 20% off and even uh, the first five uh, employees or something like that is free, right? Because they're friends of mine and now they're friends of yours. So that's my friends at Cake Equity. Check that out. Uh, let's see, if you are watching this later, because this is replayed on YouTube and everything, you can uh, visit and post questions and we'll get back to them. Uh, okay, here's the disclaimers and then we'll get to it. Um, not qualified legal or financial advice. I am a licensed attorney and I also have a financial background as a former Wall Street investment banker and now serial investor. But this is not personal professional advice. This is just entertainment uh, for some from some guy you met on the internet. Okay, so please don't rely on this. Consult on your own professional advisors and you need to pay those folks because their advice can make or break you. This session is also being recorded and will be shared widely online. So don't say anything stupid <laughs> or anything um, that's too confidential, frankly, right? Let's talk in generalities and I'll help you as much as I can. 
If you'd like to, while I'm clicking on things, you're welcome to connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn. Please tell me why you're clicking though. I get lots, I get a dozen or more requests every day. So please come and tell me why you want to connect and I will be happy to do that and follow up with you. And there we go. Okay. So after all that, let's get to it. So backstage we have, uh, everybody's trying to, uh, it says the back room is full. There's only room for 10 folks at a time in the back room. So if you are trying to join us, thank you. Great, great to see you, but um, we're gonna work through those questions and then we'll get through. Uh, and then some of those folks will leave and they'll go and watch on YouTube or LinkedIn or something. And that will allow more space in the back room. Okay, so um, you stop trying to join for the moment and we'll get to you in a little while. All right, so, sorry guys, uh, all of you patiently waiting. So Ella and uh, Kirk and uh, David and Randy and Kathy, you know what? I'm going to bring you guys on and why don't you all just tell everybody what you want to talk about. Uh, so David, turn on your webcam. Here comes Ella and Hubert and Randy and let's see. Sorry, we got a bunch here. David, like I said, if you want to join us, happy to meet you, but you got to turn on your camera because this is like TV. Uh, sorry, trying to click on these little tiny boxes. And there's Muhammad and Eric and Kagate and Tori and Kirk. Turn on your cameras and you can join us as well if you'd like. But let's, let's, uh, there's David. Okay. There's another one. And okay, full house here. All right. Well, let's start with you folks. Nice to meet all of you. Hello. <laughs> um, good to see some of you again so let's just go around the room and um just tell me really quickly this isn't the time to ask the question just tell me real quickly if you could what your question is about and i'll take some notes and then we'll go through them in a logical order okay so ella if you don't mind can you tell us where you're from and what you'd like to ask about hi scott um i'm from bolivia and Excellent. my question is about funding strategy for an online supermarket startup Yes, you, you emailed in, didn't you? Okay, Ella wins the prize because she actually sent in the question beforehand. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. And I think you're the first time I've had anybody from Bolivia. So welcome to you. Bienvenidos. All right. And let's see. Let's try um, who's after this. Uh, David. David, what are you, what's on your mind today? Uh, so in building the pitch deck, Scott, um, some, uh, as an engineer, sometimes we get too wrapped around the axle with this <laughs> stuff. I, I'm aware of it. Yep. It's like one of those things it's hard to stop. I mean, how I, I, there's frameworks out there for this, pl plenty of them, but how important really is it? I've, I've heard it's not, you don't have to worry about uh, fancy or anything like that. Just make sure the content is in there. Okay. Right. So, but do you go all the way from like compute black and white slides? I, you know, I don't need animated clowns jumping up and down, but I mean, right. you right. Okay. Well, all right. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that. That's a great one as well. Um, Hubert, my friend Hubert's here from Hong Kong in the middle of the night. Once again, nice to see you, Hubert. Nice to see you. Um, my question is about setting up a data room for angel data investors. Room, right. Oh, and you, you sent in yours as well. Thank you. Hubert is a regular attendee. He's the smartest person on this call because he comes back every month with another good question. He's working his way down the chain and he's going to get funded and then, then we'll never see him again, but he's, he's doing very well. <laughs> Okay, nice to see you. And Randy, you're you're back again too. Nice to see you. Yes, good to see you, Scott. Thank you for doing this. Um, my quick question has to do with funding. Uh, what the thresholds for versus angel versus VC? Um, I don't want to get into too much, but you know, yeah, it's yeah. that battery. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you for the quick version. You know how this works. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Well, nice to see you all. I'm going to turn you off for a second. Can you give me a, th a quick thumbs up or wave or something? We got to share this on social media, of course, to say what a great time we all had. Yay. Okay. Thank you. All right, cool. So that's a good start. Now let me let these folks go for a second and then we'll be back and let me figure out where we're going to start here. Oh, well, Muhammad, I miss Muhammad. Hey, Muhammad, how are you? Yeah. Hello, Scott. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for your referral to the attorneys. Um, I, I sent you an email, so thank you for that. My Great. question for today is uh, how important is the role of COO in a startup founding team member? Oh, interesting. Okay, good. We haven't had that one before. Nice. Nice to see you. Yep. Great. And we will bring, I'll bring you back in a minute as well. So that's some good ones all the way there. So it looks like uh, Kagate and Eric and Tori and Kirk will get back to you. Okay. Let me deal with what we've got here. A lot of good questions. Um, let me think for a moment here in terms of order. Um, let's see. Uh, grocery startup, pitch decks, data room, angels versus VCs, attorney referrals, and CEO. Okay, that's a bunch. Um, 
All good questions. Let's see. And let me just check that against. I had some more details because, like I said, some of the folks were generous enough to let me know in advance. So here's some details that Ella had sent and Troy as well. And Beverly, I don't see Beverly yet, but Beverly, you should. This was a good one. And what is this? This is a something from one of my kids. That's not helpful. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so let's go here. Oh, sorry. Let me say hi to the folks in the chat room. Um, don't want to ignore anybody. Here's Pauline from Gatineau, Canada. Welcome to you, Pauline. And back over here. There we go. Um, let's see. Rhythm from India. Mark from San Jose. Uh, Shantanu. Thank you for confirming LinkedIn, Shantanu. And Alice says YouTube. Kieran, excellent. Audrey, Andre, nice to see you again. Okay, we got plenty to talk about here. Um, yep, uh, CEO of Cake. Zach says the CEO of Cake is a super nice guy. Yeah, Jason. Uh, Jason and Kim are both really nice guys. Um, let's see. And Athena, hey, good to see you, Athena. Um, my LinkedIn again, sure. It's um, it's a LinkedIn. Uh, I've got to, yeah, I'll, I'll hold on. I'll just do it. Um, Michael Guerrero, yes. Okay. Okay. It looks like nothing's on fire. So we will get back to you folks in a second. Let's do that. And then we're going to start with, I think we'll start with David and his question about pitch decks. Um, there it is. Somebody asked for this. So let's do this. Um, and you're welcome to say hello over there. But like I said, I get tons and tons of LinkedIn inbound. Um, so please say hello there and let me know why you're connecting, that we have some kind of connection. Otherwise, I just get spammed like crazy. Um, OK, so let's talk to David. And there's the startupcouncil.org URL. And where'd my friend David go? Do, 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 do. So many little buttons. There he is. OK, thank you, David. <laughs> OK, so where are you David? geographically? I mean. I'm in San Clemente. San Clemente. Oh, you're nearby. OK, excellent. Nice to see you. Um, okay, so, so David says he's an engineer, and engineers, he's, he's, he's smart, he knows some of his own limitations. We all have blind spots, and engineers are famous for seeing things in a certain way, right? And sometimes that means you miss other things. So he, that's kind of the basis of your question. I think that's brilliant, right? Because we all need to know we're not good at. And I'm a three-time three tech founder, okay. right? Uh, uh, but, you know, I, get, I, I always had somebody do this. I see. Right. So here I am. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. OK, well, good. So you've been down the road before. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at how to how broad to make the pitch deck. Was that? Kind well, of I've not I've not gone through the f uh, getting funding for one of my own companies. So I started a SaaS company and we're at the beginning of it. And now it's time. And I'm putting this all together. And I'm uh, thank you for what you do, by the way. It's very helpful. I appreciate it because you're right. It, I'm in M&A and it. It's a it's a snob fest out there for the most part, but but this is really helpful. And and so I'm putting this together and I'm thinking, oh, how hard could this be? Right. Uh, and then like, ah, crap. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, well, let me give you some overview thoughts. And, and you may know some of this, but we've got a lot of people watching. So in case the basics are helpful. Right. Um, it depends. You work backwards from the audience. That's what I would do. Okay. So right. this is more like, so are you how much money are you looking for? and what stage are you at and then identifying your ideal investors so a lot of people try to do the reverse they try to tell the story yeah and go out and fit that into investors pockets right and that that can work but it's better to do it the other way right like if you identify your ideal investor um and in your case and i don't know and we unfortunately we don't have time to get into it you know mm -hmm. but, I, but um mm -hmm. you know i run since you're here in southern california do you belong to the orange county startup council you I just looking at doing that now, yeah. Okay, you should do that because there's an Orange County version of this. Right. And we have events locally and we could meet and talk and so forth. Right. Well, but anyway, for the rest of the planet. Um, so you want to spend twice as much time on the research of the investors as you do actually on the pitch. Because what you've got to do is you can have the best pitch in the world, but if you're in the wrong room, you're right. not going to get anywhere. So. The idea is to really look at this. And in fact, we built this whole service around this and this always comes up and that's why I built this. This is a service, ah, startupinvestorsdirectory.com. This yeah. is literally 3000 early stage startup investors that I put together. Uh, it took two years um, and this is online and you can go and research people. And the point is you can research before you start the outreach. 
so that you can find investors who invested in companies like yours. And that's where you want to start. You want to find companies that look like yours that have been successfully funded and then identify who funded them and then pitch those people. Why? Because they have a bunch of money now and they like people like you and that will get you halfway down the track. So then even if you have a shitty pitch, at least they'll be interested. You're there. They have the benefit. They'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Okay. It's as if friends and family would. And this is why most startups actually start with friends and family. It isn't because friends and family have a lot of money. It's because friends and family, although they might, it's because friends and family already know and trust you. Yeah. And that, you need to get that benefit of the doubt because any startup investment is a leap of faith, especially from angels because they're writing personal checks. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the context for this. And I, maybe you already know that, but I wanted to share that for everybody. People who think that this is like getting a car loan, like I have good credit, I'm going to walk into 10 banks or online, I'm going to type into 10 banks yeah. and pick the best rate. It's not yeah. like that. No. You have to go and build relationships and relationships are based on trust and trust is based on long-term uh, overlapping interests and values. And the best way to approximate that is to research their prior investments and get in the right room, have the right conversation with the right person. Okay. So probably you knew all that. So now that we've laid that. Um, well, you know, uh, you, you run into a lot of uh, uh, accelerators. Yeah. Tech stars and right. Those are organizations that funded like companies that I could find. Yeah. So that's different, right? Than what we're talking about, but I get it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then the pitch deck specifically, well, why don't you give me something more specific to chew on and, I, and I'll try to help you. Well, well, you, you know, the, you start with the problem and then, you know, the solution and the market, right? I get, uh, and, and, uh, you know, you're just wondering, uh, how important is it that from a presentation standpoint to be visual, to be, I, I suppose it depends on the person looking at it, but, it you, it's kind of like is it just the facts ma'am right just give right. me the facts don't worry about you know pictures or any of this other stuff yeah right? just give me the words yeah right? no unfortunately i wish that were true because i always find the graphics and the pictures to be the most difficult part as well i want to tell the story and move on but unfortunately it's sales and the okay. standard for decks these days is quite high um, okay. even decks that you think you did yourself that you think look pretty good, probably not going to cut it. I'm part of tech coast angels, which by the way, you should pitch if you're here locally, <laughs> uh, we see lots and lots of decks and they're nice. I and mean, that's okay. all there is to it. They're nice. And you, you're going to have to allocate a few bucks at least to find somebody. Um, and unfortunately that's an iterative process as well. You're probably going to have your text. And then it's going to be back and forth because they're going to find pictures and, and nobody can read your mind. Right. right. And you've really got to find somebody who can get the vibe and understand your industry enough to okay. add pictures that are relevant. Okay. Um, a lot of it is the difference between, as, as David said, everybody, right. It's problem solution, market size, yeah. um, and then not too much detail, um, yeah. not too many words on each slide. Like there was an old uh, thing. I think guy Kawasaki used to say like 10, 10, 10, 10 pages, or was it 10, 20, 30, something like that, 10 pages, 20 words per page, 30 point font or something like that. Like simple, right? Right. Yeah. Simple concepts with a pretty graphic or an illustration is even better, like a chart, you know, or something that, you know, hockey stick graphs, right. you know, keep it simple because the point of a deck is not to get an investment. The point of a deck is to get to the conversation about an investment. It's really just a teaser. It's just the first date. And, um, it's it's less than that. It's the Tinder profile, right? It's the. It's, it's, <laughs> I just don't want you to swipe left. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Right. It's that, right? You just got to get in the room, and that's mm -hmm. why it goes back to being in the right room, right? Because if you're pretty, that can get you in the room. But then, if these investors are all late stage aerospace investors, they're not going to have no interest in your early stage SaaS company, right? right. So right. it's a combination of those things. I, okay. Is that helpful? I was still. Kind that's of, right. No, well, you're kind of you're exactly answering the question because that's what I was wondering. Is it, is it just you know, don't worry about the pictures and us. And what you're saying is, no, 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 it does matter. It does. Uh, you got to have, you know, a sharp A1 presentation, yeah. not just a bunch of words on some slides. Yeah, unfortunately. And it's not because no. it matters. It's because it matters. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK. That's yeah, it just, it just does because of the competition. I guess that's really the point. If it was right. just you, you know, and a room full of investors and they had to put their money in something in the next hour, then you're going to win. But they don't, right? We have an infinite amount of alternatives, especially at the mm -hmm. angel level. Um, and the other decks are pretty. So there you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Yep. I, I absolutely get that. And Tech Los Angeles, by the way, was one of the first organizations I worked with in 2000. Oh. Ted Smith and I go way back. Right. Too far. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, yeah, you, look, you guys looked at Magellan Software here in Irvine. Uh, uh, but yeah, interesting. Okay. Good. Well, hope to see you again. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. You bet. All right, so that's our friend David from San Clemente. Hopefully that was useful to the rest of you. Other folks in the chat room, I forgot to say, by the way, let me know in the chat room if you are agree or disagree or whether you have advice, right? Because I don't have all the answers. I'm just like the guy running the meeting, right? Um, there's a lot more expertise on that side of the camera than on this side of the camera. So if you have something to say or resources to share that would help David or help each other or further questions about pitch decks and so forth, go ahead, you know, please put them in the chat room and, and add your own LinkedIn's. That's fine too. What I'm really trying to do here is help you all help each other. I can't help everybody. Right. Um, and you all are an army. So let's, you know, help each other. Okay. So that was our friend, David. And next up, let's try, um, let me see here. I'm, I'm going to look at these details again. I want to, let's see. Troy wanted to pitch. Oh, I forgot. We're going to do some pitches later as well. If you want to practice a quick pitch and get feedback from me and the audience. Um, and then, okay, so that's that. Data room, pitch deck, finding angels versus VC. Okay, let's try. Um, let me bring on Ella. Ella, I know you had, you were being very patient. You were here first. So let's bring on, this is Ella. Hello, Ella. Hi, Scott. Hey, nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure. So I have the details, but why don't you kind of uh, summarize for the for the group here, and then we'll we'll talk about it. Sure. I'm launching an online supermarket, and I'm looking for investment. Now I know it's very capital intensive. Uh, so what I decided is as a strategy is to do the front facing aspect, the customer facing uh, components. And which is the MVP, uh, the customer app, the delivery services, and the AI customer service, um, which is about a tenth of the whole um, funding that I would require. But with that, I think it would be more attractive uh, to investors. And I was wondering whether that was a uh, smart approach and um, how to go about it, how to present it and showing that this is just a component and I'm trying to uh, also further down the line include the operational components, which is the warehouse equipment and inventory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good questions. So, is just to clarify a little bit, when you say um, online grocery capital intensive, are you actually going to stock and own the gro the groceries themselves, the food, or is this more a software platform to work with existing inventory? No, it's to have our own warehouse and inventory. We're doing so completely vertically integrated then. Okay. So that's okay. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, For operational efficiency and cost uh, okay. management. Cool. All right. So, and I have to ask, your English is perfect. You Did you go to school here in the States? I've never. Yeah, I went to um, Purdue University in the States. Okay, cool. Yeah, you, you sound like I have cousins in Indiana. You're, you, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. Well, nice to meet you. I don't, like I said, I don't think we've had anybody from Bolivia before, so that's cool. Um, okay, so yes, I think you need to slice up your, um, your business into phases, essentially. Uh, the trick is, well, another pre-question. Do you see the funding opportunities there in Bolivia? And if so, are they angels, friends and family, VCs? Or are you going to come to the States? Or like, who do you think the target is for this pitch? It would be more Latin America. Um, it's a little more limited in Bolivia, the, the funding options, but open up to Latin America mm -hmm. uh, because at the end goal is to be regional. So be Latin America. Okay. And there are funding entities that would you have your eyes on some people. Is this, is there are people that do this in Latin America? I, I apologize. I don't really know. Yes. Okay. There are, it's not as much as the States, but there, there are alternative and I'm looking at, at corporate VCs, angels, VC, like the seeing, like, like you mentioned uh, previously to focus, understand those investors and what their thesis is right. and work from there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I, I know in, broad strokes that that's all happening. I just don't know the specific market. So good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the reason I ask is because I don't know where they are in the evolution of the venture of the capital markets in Latin America. 
So I can mostly give you advice as if this were in the States. And then you, you'll have to kind of adjust because I don't know either Bolivia or Latin America in terms of the capital markets, like I said. But if if this was in the States, I like I said, I think I agree. You would want to fund the first part, you know, in, in phases and pitch it that way. The trick is, and I, I was glad you um, RSVP'd first. And just for the rest of you, please RSVP. This helps me think about this more um, and I can give a better answer. Well, hopefully Ella thinks it's a better answer. We'll see. Um, but I had a chance to think about it, which was I'm concerned for you because in the States, you're not going to get funded because it's, and I may be misunderstanding this, like I just met, but phases like that, that require a lot of capital investment later are concerning because the investors here, they all want money now. Right. And I would like to see, and this is my question to you, is there a phased approach in which you can do the front end things you're talking about and create revenue there? Because if it takes just for example, you know, a million this year, 3 million next year, and then 10 million three years from now, nobody's going to give you 10 million unless the first 4 million generated some revenue. So are, are you seeing these phases as independently revenue producing or is it all back end loaded? The first phase and the second phase, uh, the first phase, not really, but the first phase is only takes six months. So it's a really short, it's six to eight months. So it's a short phase. Okay. The second phase, which is about a million and a half, um, then it can generate revenue quite quickly. And if it's all ramped ramp up from the first phase. So within a year in the second phase, you're already generating revenue and results and all that stuff. Okay. The thing is that, the first phase, since right now I don't have something that's functioning and that's uh, creating results, that MVP will by itself create right. the initial leverage and the customers and that kind of stuff. And that's your problem. I, I don't know you. I don't want to offend you, but you got to figure that out because at least in the States, nobody's going to do that right now. Um, there are too many easy ways, easy, not so easy, but relatively easy ways to put a half a million dollars in something and prove some market traction. Um, mm -hmm. You do something like you're talking about, it, it may spin out a zillion dollars in five years, but it's going to be really hard to get funded. <coughs> Excuse me. Unless, and here's the big unless, and this is going to be my next question for you, unless you know somebody or you have expertise that's compelling in this industry, do you have a, a really rich uh, aunt or uncle or do you have some expertise or connection in the grocery industry that, that puts you at some other level? I mean, I had 12 years of experience in the food service industry. Um, so that's a good leverage. And um, the funding is the, the issue. No, it's, it's not a large funding. We're talking about 150,000. So it's not much. Okay. Well, that helps. Um, it, it's not yet yeah, the, the, larger funding is down later down the road. So it's mm -hmm. it's just a proof of concept uh, with the expertise of the team, uh, myself and the CTO to deliver on that, it, which is not a large amount. Yeah, no, agreed. That definitely helps. 150 is different than 500. It's different than a million for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, so I'm not trying to be discouraging. The whole point of the show is to be encouraging. <laughs> so, but but I guess you heard my point, I think. Like I would think about that because investors these days, they don't, they don't even... I'll say we, we don't really even look at stuff anymore unless there's some kind of traction. Um, and that's not because, well, first of all, venture investors are not nearly as risk hungry as everyone pretends, right? We are risk averse as hell. Why? Because it's our money, especially as angels, right? So we are risk averse completely, except when compared to bond investors and stock market investors and real estate investors, right? And that's why it's called risk capital, because compared to real assets, it is risky, but we're still not hungry for risk, right? So everybody these days is looking for startups that spin up fast and spin off some at least proof of concept. And ideally that proof of concept is in terms of revenue and ideally profits, right? And then the money will come flying at you, right? So you are in the classic right. chicken and egg scenario and that's why you're here, right? That's why you're asking. Um, and so I get it and I've been there. Um, my first company I ran on credit cards for like three years and pretty much bankrupt mm -hmm. itself, right? And it didn't work. Right. I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. I did better after that, obviously. But um, I would be looking at credit cards. I'd be looking at friends and family um, and doing something. Uh, I was glad to say you answered one of my other questions, which is, is this just you? You say you have a CTO. That's great. So you're the non-technical person and they're more the technical person, I guess. Yeah, perfect. So that that's good, because one of the first 
hurdles that people um, stumble on, and this may come up during the show, in fact, is people always ask, do I really need a co-founder? And, and this is the same thing with traction. It's like, you don't really need a co-founder and you don't really need traction if you have a, a the world's most brilliant idea. But both of those demonstrate, like if you don't have a co-founder, then as an investor, we can't even believe that you can convince anybody, right? If you can't find anybody even to work with, if you're a solopreneur and you want like mm -hmm. you know a million dollars, why should we believe you? Like. A lot of people have good ideas. This is about implementation. So all of you who don't have a co-founder and are frustrated by that, that's why. I don't care if you have a co-founder. What I want to know is, can you convince other people this is a good idea? That's what we need. And that's traction, right? So that's your first traction point. So the next point is, okay, can you and your co-founder, Ella, can you do something with no money or with $5,000 or something, your credit card or something that demonstrates some kind of traction? It doesn't have to be real revenue based on this awesome end-to-end -end system that you've envisioned five years out, you know, that serves directly from the grocery and, you know, is delivered by robo flying drone taxis or something, you know, I don't know what your mission is, but, you know, it doesn't have to be that. But show me that, okay, you convince a co-founder, who else can you convince, right? Do you have a letter of interest from your friends in the food service industry? Do you have an angel investor who at least put in 10 grand? Like anything is more than nothing. And that's where I would be working if I were you, because I believe you, have this thing that's going to work in five years but let's make the first dollar now right sign the first deal now anything is traction compared to zero and that's what i would be concerned about and that's what i would be looking at in terms of your phases so phase one what is it you can do that's going to show something right if, if you know if we give you 100 grand what are the milestones this is the other big thing for everybody I've done this enough now. Sorry, you asked me one question. I talked for an hour. <laughs> but, but the other big thing is if you're going to ask for that money, don't just ask for the money and put up one of those stupid pie charts that says, oh, you give us money. Well, we're going to spend it 40 percent on marketing and 40 percent on people and 20 percent on admin. No shit. That doesn't tell me anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're going to build and what kind of results you're going to get. Right. Say we're going to build the front end system and we're going to sign up 16 customers and cover, you know, whatever, 50 SKUs of inventory by December. And then after that, we're going to like show us specifics, right? So that you've thought this through. Again, it doesn't have, it's like your pro formas. We don't know that it's going to happen. Obviously, it's compounded assumptions. But show us that you've thought it through. And that if this money goes in, something's going to happen other than you just kind of using it as a checkbook and going to some conferences and having a good time, right? So anyway, sorry, you got me going there. Um, is that helpful? <laughs> that, no, that is helpful. I mean, I, I, I understand of getting traction because I can get... Um, customers already, um, while it's it won't be profitable, we'll just be covering the costs. Um, at least that shows uh, some level of growth, and I can demonstrate yeah. that. Great, that's um, the word growth. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I understand that. That makes yeah. sense, that, and that's something you can do because I can use other um, software to do the the whole process, or even do it through communication channels and do it manually. I, I, yes. That can be done to show that there is interest uh, and there's action behind that. Okay. That awesome. makes sense. Now you got Perfect. it. That's exactly, you, you, totally, you got it. That's exactly the right answer. So she hit okay. the key word there, guys, is growth. Traction, co-founders, mm -hmm. everything, all of that is a proxy for we want to see growth. We want to see momentum. This isn't just some crazy idea you had, but things are actually moving and other people believe you and want to play. They want to buy, right? So anything you can do to, to even if it's, I don't want to say fake it, but like uh, demonstrate the concept you know, even if it's not scalable, like Paul Graham from Y Combinator, I think it's him, one of the famous quotes, do things that aren't scalable. Like when you get in a software mindset, like me, I do this too. Like when I get out there, it'll all work great. But getting the first five customers usually means walk to somebody's office, lunch, you know, and like physically, like building a relationship. And that's frustrating if you want to like build this grand thing, but doing things that don't scale is key. And that's exactly what Ella was just saying. Using existing software, fine. You know, actually going out and signing up some real people, fulfilling it manually. Like there are companies that will go and build an e-commerce operation with no inventory. And like in your example, they'll go, somebody ordered bananas. We got our first order. It's bananas. And they will drive to the grocery store, buy some bananas and deliver the bananas. Right. Just because they got the, they're proving the order piece of it, not the banana inventory piece of it. Right. And you got to prove those pieces and ideally repeatedly. And then you get the money to to build it so it will scale for real. So, okay. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate <laughs> <All right>. it. <laughs> I hope to see you again. Keep us posted. That sounds exciting. Nice stuff. Will do.
All right. Go Boilermakers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, guys. My throat is killing me here. Let's uh, let's check in with our chat room. Um, okay, room is full. I'm getting repeated messages here. A lot of people don't want to join us. So I hate to do this, but Ella and David, if I've already talked to you, if you don't mind, if you could leave and go over to YouTube or LinkedIn and watch there, that would allow two more people to come in in the back room um, using the founderofficehours.com URL. Okay, let me hit the chat here um, and work our way through here for just a minute. Um, let's see, Boston, Long Beach, Switzerland, Hawaii. Um, let's see, Zach says, I want to probably, well, not anymore. Okay, this is a good question. We can do this one real quick. Um, give some love to the chat room folks. There we go. I've been working on prepping our seed round. Well, I roughly know the dollar amount we need for runway to next milestone. I worry if our ask is too high for a seed. Okay, Zach, good question. Uh, two caveats there. The two assumptions you're making, uh, could, well, you could be right, but let me unpack that a little bit. First of all, seed round. Seed round could mean anything these days. I think the prevailing advice I would give these days is don't call it a seed round. Don't call it an anything round. If there's a number you have in mind, just say it's a $300,000 round, right? Because a seed round or a pre-seed or an A varies so much from industry to industry. And also pre and post COVID valuation wise, that it doesn't really necessarily mean that much anymore. I mean, if you're researching investors and you see on a uh, VC website that they do seed, well, that tells you it's probably less than $10 million. But in some industries these days, it might be $30 million, right? So the, the I would just drop the seedness of it. It doesn't add anything really. If you say I want $300,000, everybody can, that, they know what you want. They don't necessarily know what you mean by seed. And then if it's a lot of money, <clears throat> Again, that's specific to your industry, so I don't know, um, but it kind of is what it is, right? Um, so there I would suggest um, adding a little language around that. You need to say something because otherwise people don't know, right? You may know that you mean between 200 and 800,000 and you could do either one, but they don't know. So you have to say something. Don't just say we're raising money. You have to give people a target because people know how big their wallets are, whether it's individual angels or it's firms, right? So say something like, give it a range, right? Say it's whatever it is, 250 to 450, right? And then negotiate because honestly, it's always a range, right? If you're looking for 300,000 and somebody gave you a really bad valuation, then you might only want 100, right? But if they give you an amazing valuation, well, you'd probably take five. So it's a range anyway. So um, using words like range and flexible are helpful. Don't make it sound too flexible because then it sounds like you don't know what you're doing or they'll try to push you around. But that's what I would do. Drop the seed and uh, make it a little more flexible sounding. All right. I hope that helps. All right. Cool. So that was a quick one. Good. Um, let's see. San Jose. Um, what are the top three things you look for or judge? when someone reaches out to you with a startup idea. That's a good one, Kieran. Kieran's back. Yeah, I think you've been here before. Nice to see you. Um, top three things. Um, it's really hard to say. I mean, the, the top three things usually boil down to something like, you know, of course, the idea and then the market size. A lot of times people have ideas that are too small. It's hard to believe, but investors usually want something that's not just going to make 10 times their money. They need like 100. Why? Because we lose money on like 90% of the things we do. So if your business can't take a million dollars and turn it into a hundred million dollars, you're probably not a venture capital backed opportunity. You still be maybe a great investment opportunity, but maybe more for loans or other kinds of capital, right? But you really need to think, is my business like, could I have a thousand people working for me on this or 10,000 people? Right. That's people want like Uber, right? A globe spanning or Facebook, a globe spanning enterprise with hundreds of thousands of people. Right. If you can't do that, then maybe VC isn't for you. So that's another thing. And, and it really boils down to I'm sorry, I'm really losing my voice here. <clears throat> Just let me get another cough drop here. Um, it really boils down to be investable. Right. And that's a combination of things. It's like it's a good idea. The person sounds smart. They have a track record. The market is large enough. They're asking for a reasonable amount of money that's in my range. Like if they ask for $10 million, that's not me. You know, if um, 
Are they, uh, do they have a co-founder or other people? Do they have any traction? I mean, it's all those things, right? But it boils down to, th this is the key, I think. Kieran, turn it around. If you got this, would you say, and pretend you had whatever, half a million dollars in the bank that you were looking to play with. Is this where I want to put it? Does this person sound like they know what they're doing? <laughs> Do I want to hang out with this person and build a personal relationship that's going to last five or 10 years because they're going to kick some ass and take this idea to the moon? That's what you need. You need to be investable. Sorry, it's not any easier than that. Okay. Um, Andre says, came from LinkedIn to say that looks like LinkedIn messages are not getting into the chat. Oh, I think you're right, Andre. Oh, well, that was half an hour ago. It looks like they are now. So thank you. Oh, Phyllis just popped in. Uh, did you say a hundred times growth from X? Yes. Well, a hundred times growth of anything. Yes. So, um, we want to be specific, Phyllis, we're talking about the valuation really, right? So if I put in money and the company's valued at uh, $2 million, I'm hoping it's going to be worth $200 million because my little piece of it, the piece I got for 20 grand or whatever, well, hopefully, you know, it's going to get diluted as well, right? If I'm an early investor. So yeah, a hundred times real money is venture capital is not for small businesses. It's for growth businesses. All right. Um, let's see. Um, please clarify the stage at which most of the projects and products I invest are. Do they have an MVP, just an idea or an idea along with a tested business plan or pitch deck? Well, you're asking about me, Alice, and I'm happy to talk about me, but that's not really the point. And then I'm going to get to, I think, uh, Randy. We're going to go to Randy next. Um, yeah, Randy. And then we got Hubert and Muhammad as well. Um, uh, what I do, I'm an angel investor. So speaking in terms of angel investors, the checks tend to be, it depends on the person, but you know, 5,000 to $100,000. They tend to be at the earlier stages where something is, um, again, depends on the person, depends on their industry experience and their interests. Angels usually want to add value as well. So it's helpful if it's an industry that we know. And it's probably at the pre, what we would call pre-seed or seed, as I just said, that doesn't have a lot of meaning when talking about the amounts, but in terms of idea, it means an idea that's just kind of getting together and probably doesn't have a lot of customer activity yet, but ideally has some traction. There's no black and white answer there. Um, there's actually a page, uh, if you're asking about me specifically, let me show you this caption. I put up a page, people ask me all the time, you know, will I invest? And I'll be honest, I don't invest directly much anymore. Um, I do invest, I'm quite active as an angel investor, but where's this page? Sorry, this will be helpful to you guys, I think. There we go. Um, this is a page that talks about where I invest. Uh, and it mostly is referrals to the funds and angel groups that I belong to because I don't invest directly. I get too many plans directly. But if you apply to these different groups, you can use my name and that might help. Might not. <laughs> I think it will. Um, and you can see what their criteria are. And between them, they cover all kinds of things. Like I'm an LP. And for me, it's mostly early stage tech, right? Um, but I'm an LP, for example, in a women's fund. We only invest in women founders because I'm a big uh, believer in women's empowerment. Um, there are other ones that invest, well, all kinds of stuff, right? So that page might be helpful if you're looking about me. But generally speaking, the answer, Alice, is you've got to show you've got something going on that isn't just an idea that's out in the world with some kind of feedback. I need to come up with a word for that because traction usually means customer revenue, really. Um, but it's some kind of mix of customer adoption, team building, uh, industry relationships, and uh, a path towards revenue that is grown by responsible spending of the money we give you. So if anybody in the chat room has a suggestion on how to encapsulate that into a cool buzzword, I'm all ears. Be happy to hear from you about that. Um, Okay, sorry, here's one more. This is an easy one. Well, not easy, but how much traction is enough to go out to look for funding? I don't know. Uh, you've got to figure that out. It depends on your industry. Uh, I will tell you $1 is infinitely more than $0. And, you know, five or 10,000 or 100,000 is a lot more than $1 because it shows that you've probably done this more than once. And what you really want to show for traction is repeat customers, ideally. But um, and repeat revenue, but any traction is more than no traction. There's no bright line here. All of this is goes back to what um, 
Ella said a few minutes ago, it's about growth. What are you doing that demonstrates growth? Your idea is good. And these people believe and those customers believe and they've come back again. Any path that you can show, give investors a series of data points that show growth from outside your head and in the real world. And that's the traction you need. All right. Talk, talk, talk. Let's bring on my friend, Randy. Randy wanted to talk about, here's Randy. Hey, Randy. Hey, Scott. Good to see you. Thank you. For, nice. okay. um, your first two speakers answered quite a bit for me. Okay. And really, it helped me in putting my mindset correct. The question I had was uh, for differences between VCs and angels. And, um, and uh, I think very uh, practical in terms of what do I need is going to be used for this to solve this. And what I discovered is that maybe I'm thinking too small. And that's what uh, differentiate, uh, differentiate between the VC and angel. Um, originally, I was looking, uh, thinking, and, and I'd love to get your opinion on this. I was thinking, you know, uh, based on my numbers forecast, I was looking at something like two to 300,000 to uh, be used specifically for staffing, for salespeople. I need salespeople. Uh, and uh, our, our uh, model is uh, direct sales. And, uh, but that amount, I don't think entices uh, investors other than uh, angels. Um, and so um, if I scaled it up, that means I can bring out more people, more time, uh, more, more people to uh, go for more sales and look at the how, how many um, deals I can close based on what they're rolling in for each month, things like that. Is that, a, uh, is that a good mindset or should we stick to what the bare minimum is just to stay, stay close to bootstrapping? It? Um, I think it's a valid question. I don't, let, let's clarify. And I'm glad the earlier conversation was helpful. Um, I don't think anybody's going to give you money to hire salespeople, huh. period. If, if, if that's, if that's the end of it, and that's my point, it's not the end of it. Right. So, but if you have a, a story that shows like, have, have you had any sales yet? Yes. Yes. And that's the difficulty is that I'm wearing multiple hats. Right. And so I need to get, uh, people that are focused solely on sales. Right. right. And, and those guys getting the accounts. So I've been extremely lucky, uh, you know, a uh, case example, uh, my, my industry is in alcohol. I met with a, a general manager at one of the tasting rooms in LA, you know, it went really well. Two days later, I get an email from the uh, director of, nat of national sales saying I want to talk from the same company. So it right. went up the ladder right away. Okay. And, and now they're, uh, they have a, the um, our quote in front of them. So if I can do that, and I'm not a sales guy. I, I'm tech. I'm hardcore yeah. tech. You know, then I know uh, other sales yeah. guys can pull it. <laughs> other sales guys can pull it off. Right. But okay. I need to implement them. And I built all the tools. Um, and, and so, so that's where my mindset is. The other thing is a, a secondary question, um, the, uh, and this is really advice, kind of like um, w the things I made for the wine industry are tools to help build awareness and generate sales, and. Coincidentally, it turns out one of the tools can be used in other industries. So I've been approached and we've done a deal with uh, these podcasters. They sold out an event. They have a thousand uh, tickets being, being sold and people coming and they're going to use my tool for their event that does uh, UGC user generated content. So I'm being torn in this direction. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, what do I do? Do I do? I'm, I'm thinking, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me let me give you some feedback then. Yeah. So I started by saying nobody's going to give you money to hire a salesman, period. Right. But if the story was longer, then they might. And, the, and you have the story. That's what I was yeah. looking for. Okay. You've already made some sales. Yeah. So back to the conversation, I think it was with Ella. The traction here that you want to demonstrate is with one guy and this many hours, we yeah. generated this much sales. So imagine if I had right. two salesmen with this many hours, this many sales. Right. That's presumably what you're thinking. Yeah. That sounds starts to sound investable. Right. The trick is that from a software point of view, human salespeople don't scale as fast as software. And at yeah. least for investors like me, we want to see somebody said in the chat room. Um, I gave the example of Uber a minute ago, like not every venture is Uber. I know, but that doesn't mean I don't want an Uber. Right. Everybody wants Uber or Facebook. Right. Because because software scales globally way faster than you can hire people. So if there's an aspect to your business that you can emphasize the software doing the work as opposed to scaling 
by hiring bodies that will help you raise money because imagine you know in a, in a, a fantastic world like you know yeah. five years from now you're a national company or even international global company but that means you have fifty thousand salespeople. like that's yeah. that's not that's not going to work right it's just yeah. unmanageable right yeah. so there's a limit to it's essentially a services based business not service in that you're delivering service but the the growth is driven by humans so yeah. it's better if you can lean on the platform for your growth and if you can look at your pitch and say something like you know we're going to have this kind of growth based on what i randy have already done and i'm not even a sales guy yeah. looks good but you know after three people we'll get this much traction and with your hundred thousand dollars we'll have those three people plus we're going to double our capacity because the software gets that much better i see it's a lot more interesting right okay. if you can take three people and do the work of 10 yeah. that's where people start to get interested okay so then we're capping it off so i should be structuring that after we get uh, uh, we'll have more organic growth based on the software and the reputation that we're having in the industry the challenge that we have in this particular industry is it's very old school the wine industry where it's very relationship based yeah They're, you know the uh management and, and um the like the directors national sales they don't do any digital advertising they don't even look right. for any type of digital cool. advertising and that's why yeah. that is why they have a problem i mean i think i brought up last time last year represented the second consecutive year of negative consumption in the wine industry really? premium wines did well but consumption in general went down and that's because you've got boomers aging out gen x making different life choices and no one's catering to millennials right. and gen z right. so you know oh, okay another, another yeah. piece of advice for you totally agree with you and i totally make sense you need to be careful about that though because while it represents a huge opportunity yeah it also means that you're trying to change human behavior and yes. that's a proven way to lose money <laughs> and every investor knows that right so if you're yeah. talking about don't position your company as re-educating the wine industry because every investor has lost money when they thought some that they knew a, a better way for other people to behave. Wow. <laughs> and, that, and that's a proven way to lose money or at least to get no's from investors. You want to find things people are doing already and enhance them, to make okay. it easier for them. It's the same okay. thing, maybe, but spin it yeah. differently, right? Like they're doing this already. We're making it so much easier and faster. We're yeah. not, you're, they're stupid. We're going to teach them. That will not work. Okay. Um, and it probably won't work, honestly, because then you get it. You're a nice guy. You yeah. wouldn't do that anyway, but I'm exaggerating for effect. But um, but yeah, it sounds like you're, you're getting there. Like if you have some things that you can replicate yourself, yeah. I would be looking at like a plan that hires, you know, one or two or three people, but not more than that. And just show what you can do with that and that the software adds to it. And yeah, you might need more, but really lean on the software and see what you can do. And you might even call them. You might even call them account managers instead of salespeople or something that. Like that. that sounds more internal and functional because that's what they should be doing. I mean, if these people are really going to be like traditional salespeople, they're going to be out on the road, yeah. you, know, you know, visiting people face to face. Yeah. Investors aren't going to get excited about that. That's so time consuming, right? Yeah. It's also going to be hard to find people like that these days. The more you can automate, the better. Okay. So given that you're a smart guy and then we'll have to move on, yeah. maybe it's worth yeah. some time and Randy's brilliant mind to, to think about ways that you can entice those old school folks online. And I know they don't do it, but maybe there's some aspect of your business that you could give them for free or it's really fun or it's a, a social thing online, virtual happy hours or, or something right. to pull them into your world mm -hmm. as opposed to conceding the fact that you guys are old school and we have to go out face to face and pound the pavement, you know, and shake hands one on one some way that you can automate that that's interesting right okay i don't know what that is so that's your job but. no no but but this really just differentiates that my audience for funding should be uh angels should be uh smaller uh, sh i should be looking at the at capping at no more than probably 10 salespeople, mm -hmm. you know, and and salaries to cover that uh but based on the growth and how many you know deals we'll be getting and everything to show the return mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Right. And then we could talk all day, obviously. This yeah. is a, Yeah, sorry. No, no, but I, I, I say one more thing. And I, I, I don't push this, guys, but if anybody really wants to talk, I do private coaching calls. I have to charge for them, but you can go to um, that startup funding page or scottfox.com. I do this on a private consultative basis, but it does cost money, sorry, because um, I don't have time otherwise. Um, but I'm just going to say what you said there was interesting because if we cap at 10 people, yeah. fine. 
and you're talking about annuals, fine. The next step for that is, in my mind, immediately, the investor goes, so what's the exit, right? Yeah. And that's the next thing you would be thinking about. So say your staff is you have 10 salespeople and another five or 10 people. You got 10 or 20 people. That's the size of company. If you can support 20 people, hopefully you've got a couple million in revenue. So at yeah. some point there, somebody's going to buy you. So your exit strategy is some sort of acquisition. So the other thing to do is design for exit, right? And this I'm talking to everybody here, not just Randy. Yeah. Whatever you're doing out there, it may be cool to change the world in the way that you want to improve it. And I'm all for that. I really am. Um, but if you want to make money from it, there has to be an acquirer. And that's something else I did with my first company. I was going to change the world. I did all these fancy things. But I positioned myself by solving problems from several different industries at the same time. And that meant that none of them would buy me because it was too mixed. Of disciplinary. Uh, so anyway, just something for you to think about. And yeah. investors will want to know that as well, especially if you have a, a big sales staff who's going to buy you. And that might be fine in the wine industry because there are lots of distributors and levels of relationships in that yeah. distribution chain that might be okay. And maybe you get 5 million bucks from some big, you know, from InBev or somebody who does this anyway, and you're good, right? It doesn't have to be Uber, right? right. Um, right. But anyway, you get, you get the call. <laughs> Scott, thank you. Thank you so very much for your time. All right. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And we're going to move on. That was our friend, Randy. Oh man, it's been an hour already. I am <clears throat> losing my voice. Okay, let me hit a couple of these in the chat and then we got to hit uh, Muhammad and Hubert. And um, let's see here. So join us, okay, at Startup Council. Yes, that's the this URL here. Uh, it's a bunch of free services and it includes um, the Startup Investors Directory. There's a real deal on that. That can help you find investors. I haven't talked about this one today. This is another one that we built to help you guys. This is, you'll never believe it, it's a directory of startups. <laughs> it's a directory of startups. Um, but the idea is to get a lot of you in one place so that you can present yourself in a standard way so that investors can find you. Right? Very basic stuff. Um, and what's cool about both of these, actually, let me blow my own horn for a second. Can I get them both on camera? There we go. Um, these are the first directories in the world that allow investors and founders to categorize their found their companies and to search based on, of course, on industry, sector, stage of growth, the amount of money you're raising, that kind of thing. But they also allow companies to represent themselves and founders to search on other characteristics that I think are important. These include things about you and your team, like you are a female founder, you are a black founder, a Latin, a Latin Latinx founder. You are an immigrant. You are a veteran. You are LGBTQ. You are a first-time founder. You live in a rural area. All of those things are, and more, are categories in both of these. These both have 40 or 50 different categories so that you can get attention for the unique personal characteristics that you have that can offer your startup to the world and help investors find you based on those things. Because there are investors out there who specialize like in uh, black women founders, but how are they going to find you, right? If you, sorry, this one, <laughs> go list yourself as a black woman founder. I don't know any other directory that does that. Um, and you're a veteran, right? And this one, you're uh, an immigrant from India and you live in Kentucky. Where are they going to find you? Here, right? And these, and you can find investors that do that here. And that's why I built these. So um, there are offers. I guess I should put those up. I'm talking. Here's the um, startups directory one. There's a deal there for you guys to get going. NSD beta. NSD beta is the code. And for um, the other one, sorry, I've got too many of these here. It's SID launch for the startup investors directory. So um, they're not free. Um, but they might be free with these codes. I don't know, but we're doing it at a cost. I mean, it's taken years to build these, right? Uh, 50 bucks or something. It's really not very much, but we're trying to help and we're doing this at cost to help you get out there. So that's my big commercial. And then there's our wonderful sponsor, Cake, cakeequity.com. If you need help with your um, cap table and your stock options. Okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> wow. All right. Um, Hubert, here comes our friend Hubert. And we're going to Hubert next because he's a frequent flyer and because it's the middle of the night in Hong Kong. And I don't know, Mohammed, I don't know where you are, but he's probably up later than you are. So I forget. Sorry. You'll be next. 
Um, all right, so here's Hubert. Hey, Hubert. Data rules. Hi. Thank you so much for the opportunity and what you are doing with the startup community, and I hope you will feel better soon. So um, I don't want to, you know, I have a tendency to share uh, too much detail, but I had a pitching opportunity uh, with an angel investor. He seemed a little interested, but he said, share the data room with me. But uh, he didn't realize I actually have two entities, uh, one in Colorado, one in Delaware. I understand you, uh, you know, like uh, I'm not seeking for legal advice and stuff, but I'm kind of curious. It is, is it okay um, to tell the investor, hey, um, I'm a foreign founder. It's a little complicated uh, on a scale of one to 10. How serious are you? Uh, if you are, you know, more than a seven, then I will set it up for you because it will cost a couple of thousands of dollars to set things up correctly. But if you are just, you know, like a maybe, then I will probably not uh, set it up. So um, it's not a big turnoff if it seems like I don't have a data room set up because I will seem like an amateur. So um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And for those who don't know, a data room is basically like a Google Drive or a Dropbox or um, even a uh, thumb drive, I guess you could give somebody, but it compiles all the documentation about your company. Because one of the first things investors want to do once they decide they like you and are interested is they want to see that you're legit, right? They want to see the incorporation papers, the bylaws. They want to see the stock option agreements that I just mentioned that Cake handles. They want to see any intellectual property assignment agreements that you might have with your contractors or your developers. All that kind of stuff is critical uh, for investors to know that you're for real. Uh, and customer contracts, if there are any, all, all that stuff that shows this is a real business, not just some person with a pitch deck, right? So Hubert's question is a good one. Um, I think, Hubert, that uh, it depends a lot on the person, the situation, uh, but I think your question is completely legitimate. I mean, angel investors or any investor really is somebody that you're going to be essentially dating for a long time and really almost getting married to. So if they can't handle a frank and friendly um, question, then you're probably not somebody you want to be in business with. I don't, as you said, you want to avoid seeming like an amateur, like you don't want to say, what's a data room, <laughs> right? Which is why I just tried to explain that for everybody. Um, but um, I think you can, I think you can ask, uh, I might work on different ways to phrase that. You might say something like, what's your timeline? You know, like if I could get that to you this week or next month or by Christmas, is, is that good enough? What are you thinking? Right. And that'll kind of give you some, just give them an opportunity to sort of back, back up or move forward. Right. Um, you know, if they say, well, we have a partner meeting on Tuesday and I want to bring this to the partners, then you're like, OK, I'll get on it. Right. And if they say, oh, you know, whatever you get around to it, you can kind of read between the lines there, you know, um, and it's kind of up to you. Um, the other thing is that I think there's some in-betweens. I think you could probably start today with setting up a free Google Drive or Dropbox or DocuSign or Docu, whatever that other one is, whatever it is system you want to use and put a few things in there just so that you can say you have it. Because a lot of times you can give that link and what they were really saying was, I'm not that interested, right? So if you delay the conversation by saying, you know, uh, can you wait till October? You've just delayed the conversation. It was really a no anyway. So I think you'd be better positioned to say, yes, here's the link or, you know, I'll send it to you this afternoon and just put in like the, whatever the basic stuff, the three things you have you know, your two versions of incorporation and your stock option, just like two or three basic things, just so you say you have it. So that doesn't become a stumbling block. Because if you say, I don't have a data room, full stop. And they may have been intending full stop anyway, and that will help you find out. So you say, you know, oh, well, are, you know, how urgent is this? And they say, well, you know, pretty urgent. And say, okay, yeah, I'll get it to you this afternoon. And then run home <laughs> and put in a few basic things and, and then just see if they even go look, right? That will get that will move the conversation farther and it will tell you what you want to know anyway without spending the money. Now, the other point is that helpful? Absolutely. This is, uh, you know, it's never binary one way or the other. This is so smart. You know, I could, you know, put all of the basic stuff. If they ask follow up questions, then I will give yeah. them the entire picture. Then, if they are like, I like lukewarm, then, you know, I, I never had to spend thousands of dollars to, you know, do the IP transfer and do that jazz anyway. So, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. And that's a great way to put it, uh, Hubert. None of this stuff is binary. 
It really isn't, especially those of you who have, as we we're teasing David, David was teasing himself earlier about being an engineer or you're a coder or, or somebody who just sees things very black and white. None of this is binary. It's all kind of squishy, relationship based. And the only thing that's binary is whether the check hits your bank account or not. That's the only one, unfortunately, right? And even then there could be arguments about the valuation or you know delayed payments or whatever. So it's very rarely binary. So think about what you can do to serve your needs, you know, without being unethical, but like, what do they really want to know? They want to know that I have a data room. They want to know that I'm organized enough to do that. And how urgent are they? I think those are reasonable questions. Um, now, the other thing to ask is um, the thing about you being, you know, a uh, Colorado corporation and, and Hubert's another one who emailed in sooner. So thank you. I had time to think about this. Um, he's got multiple domiciles for his corporation and then he's not in the U.S. Uh, you know, it gets a little complicated. Um, there's no reason you're going to have it's all going to come out soon. Right. But how quickly you put it out there, up to you. I wouldn't, right? Get them excited first uh, and ease into it. Um, but as soon as they're serious, don't delay because then they'll feel like you hid something. So again, not a hard and fast binary answer. Um, but um, if you're going to put all that stuff in the data room, you probably want to tell them before it goes in the data room so they don't get there. And they're like, what is this? Which company are we even talking about? They'll like be a little offended, right? Like, I thought we were talking about this, but what's this other thing? So you do need to get that on the table sooner than later. But um, these two questions merge uh, at this point, which is there doesn't need to be just one data room. There can be a data room for the casual guy. There can be a data room for the serious people or three levels, right? Because you're not going to put all your really confidential stuff out there to somebody who's just kicking the tires or might even be invested in a competitor and are looking at you to figure out who your customers are, right? So this is there's not one size fits all here. This also is not binary, unfortunately. Um, so I would think about how you want to deliver that message, um, work it into your verbal discussion. You know, just casual though, like, you know, yeah, I'll be happy to give you that. And, you know, by the way, you, you probably know this because I'm in Hong Kong, but, you know, there this company, I set it up over here and there. And you'll see that when you get in the data room, it's no big deal. It's all consolidated now. We are a Delaware C Corp but I put it all in there in the interest of full disclosure and make it look like you're being a cool, smart, ethical person rather than you're hiding something like get it out there. Um, and then you don't have to show them everything. And to your point, uh, and then we'll move on. It's a great way to get them to ask more questions. And that's how you build a relationship and get them to be an investor. So even if you had all that stuff ready, I don't think I would give it all. All right, not sure what happened. Okay, that was a little funky. Hopefully everybody's still there. <laughs> uh, I was just finishing up there with Hubert. Hubert, please don't take that personally. I don't know if that's him or me, but I'm still here. And it looks like several of you guys are too. Okay, 1.12 p.m. There's Hubert, okay. okay. Um, thank so you very much insight uh and may i ask one quick final question what about like um i'm not the type of people that if they you know want to see my pitch deck uh, they have to sign an nda you know like uh you know people don't do that but like if i have to share like financial statements you know like all of the sensitive stuff is it reasonable to ask investors if we are kind of like serious about uh potential partnership um you know like i don't want you to you know talk about my financial statements and you know like my current situation is it reasonable to ask them to send sign an NDA at that point or like people just don't do it people at any don't. phase if they're real investors they won't do it I just see too many deal okay. I can't it's not because I don't want to or I have any intention of unethical behavior I just can't I mean because it just, it's the same way in Hollywood um, movie studios don't accept unsolicited scripts because then every time they make a movie, 47 people will show up and say well I mailed I wrote I sent in a script that had that story and you know that's my story. Like you just can't, you, you don't know. So um, understood. Thank you so not, much. If they're not a professional investor, they might, or especially if it's a corporate investor and they're in the habit of doing that maybe. Um, but I, I would stay away from it. That's why you need that back and forth conversation to build the relationship first. It's, the relationship is more important than the NDA. Cool. Understood. Thank you so much. All right. Nice to see you again, Hubert. Keep us posted. Hubert is, uh, let's see, there we go. Hubert is uh, working his way down the track here towards funding. It's very exciting to watch this. Every month he's here. 
<laughs> okay, keeping going here. We've got uh, Mohammed and Troy wanted to practice pitch. Troy's still here. Thank you, Troy, for uh, sticking around. Let's bring Mohammed on. We're going to talk about uh, COOs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Scott. Even though you're not feeling well, you're taking the questions. So I appreciate that. Okay. Um, my question, just to give you a little bit of context, I have built a B2B SaaS based startup to help empower existing developers be able to build enterprise grade infrastructures on AWS because I was a former AWS solutions architect. Nice. Now I have been doing it for a while myself, wearing different hats, you know, marketing, CEO, you know, CTO hats. But recently I have onboarded a chief marketing officer, very smart guy from, um, you know, graduate from MIT and Salesforce experience. I am going to investors now and asking for, like we are trying to raise $250,000 in, in, uh, in funding. Now, a few of them asked me that who's your COO because that's the most important role uh, inside an organization, like manages all the operations and stuff. So I was just wanted to ask you, what's your take on it? What do you think? Should it, should we go ahead and onboard a COO? Because I also have to do a CEO. I've been playing that role for a while and not being able to focus on the technology side of it. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, get your opinion on it. Hopefully it makes sense. And what, yeah, it does, sure. And what role is it that you expect to play if you hire both a CEO and a COO? Uh, CTO. CTO. Because I'm from a very technical background, over 20 years of experience, so I think I can play a lot better role uh, compared to the other two. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, let me mention, uh, I will answer the question, but mm -hmm. you said earlier that the attorney referral was helpful, which is great. That's right. It was. Thank oh, you for that. You're welcome. So um, I wanted to mention that to everybody. We, um, one of the things we do at the Startup Council is connect people. And a lot of people need attorneys and they need accountants and they need this and that and the other. <laughs> and i um, happy to do that. So if you are looking for a good startup attorney, uh, we'd be thrilled to help you because I have several who are sponsors of ours and they're very good attorneys and they want to meet people like you. And uh, um, we did this for Muhammad just uh, in the last couple of weeks since last month when, when he asked me. So, um, and the way to do that, I guess, let me finish the thought, go to scottfox.com or startupcouncil.org and use the contact form there. And you can email us and we'll introduce you to several. Uh, and um, that's all there is to it. And apparently it works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So cool. Um, all right. So uh, to find a COO. Okay. So, the um, couple levels of question there. So the investors are going to want to know who runs the business. So um, I, let, let's be careful about the terminology because I wouldn't hire anybody as chief anything uh, mm -hmm. until you've worked with them for a while. And entrepreneurs often do this and it's understandable. Um, Non-technical founders want to find a CTO and CTOs want to find a CEO or a COO, but it's still your company. So mm -hmm. I would be careful and this may or may not apply to you, but I'm talking to everybody, be careful about giving away chief anything. It's your company. And unless you know someone so well that you're confident that you're going to work together for at least four or five years and they're going to earn like a really big chunk of this company that you're starting, like 20, 30, 50 percent, mm -hmm. don't call them chief anything. You can call them VP of this or even, you know, princess of that. I mean, call them anything, but Got chief it. implies there's nobody above them. And it's going to be really hard if your relationship wobbles a bit or goes south to get them out of that role, because you're not going to be able to hire another chief something when that person is there. So start them with a VP level mm -hmm. um, or even consultant level and say, you know, and make it part of their vesting. The CEO, even the CEO, this is true. CEO, CEO, anything. Don't give up any of those C titles, Muhammad, until mm -hmm. you really know that person and you have them under contract that they're going to take their chunk of stock, whatever amount you deem is appropriate, and it's going to vest over several years, right? Nobody gets a grant of, I love you, we had a great lunch, and now you're my CTO or COO, and here's a third of the company. No That's way. Right. You're going to come in and it's going to vest over four years, dependent on you, you know, playing the role we with these milestones even, right? Mm -hmm. That person's mm -hmm. got to earn this because you have built something, um, especially when you're as qualified as you are with your technical background, right? You, there, you have lots of opportunities, so you don't need to give up too easily, is <laughs> my point. So, right. so what do investors think about this? Well, investors want to see more than anything. They want to see, like I've said a couple of times today, they want to see that somebody other than you believes this, right? right? So do you have a team now or is it just you? 
So I have, a, like I said, the CMO, uh, sure. acting CMO, you can say, because he's still in an early stage, and myself. So I am looking to, and we have an advisor COO, like he just, I go to him for advice. And that's about it. Uh, we have other team members like developers who are doing work for us on a contract basis, mm -hmm. but uh, not like in the uh, chief, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's what I'm looking for. More like total headcount is now like five or something. Yeah, you can say five, right, at this point. Yeah, yeah okay. So there is a team is what I'm looking for. Okay, right. so that's good. So I'm an investor. I meet you. You're a smart guy. You want to move to the technical side. There are some other people here, though. So this is the kind of traction I'm looking for. Like, this isn't a guy who's just dreaming. He's implemented mm -hmm. this. There are real people working in this. Money is being spent. Is any money being made yet? Yes. So we already have two customers and we are onboarding a couple other customers. So far, I haven't done any marketing whatsoever. So now that our marketing guy is here, nice. he will have more opportunity to do some marketing and get more leads and hopefully you can convert them. Cool. Okay, great. Good for you, man. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So they're, now they're, they want to see you diversify your executive ranks, not your junior ranks. Yeah, Correct. I think that's a pretty good question. I mean, I, I, I again, I would hesitate on COO. Mm -hmm. um, but you could call it, uh, well, I don't know, you can call it whatever you want. Um, yeah, okay, so that we've covered it all. Now, what what, what more can I tell you? Is that, was that? Well, I think the, the thing I was wondering is not necessarily COO, but anybody mm -hmm. who's handling the operations, is that something that the investors are looking for before they actually even bother, you know, looking at that company? Like who's doing the operation? Is that the most significant role? It, it might be now, it, it, it is not at an earlier stage, given what you've already accomplished. Mm -hmm. You have a product, you have customers, you're generating mm -hmm. revenue. It is the next question. It's the next question. It's not the base question, but you've already accomplished a lot. So yeah. everybody in the chat room, give Muhammad a hand. <laughs> Thank, you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And so that is the next question because cool. implementation is now what needs to be done. Implementation and execution. So that's what they're asking. They're saying, how are you going to grow this? And if you're saying, I'm not the growth guy, mm -hmm. they're asking who is, right? Or gal, right? Yeah. And that's a reasonable question. So um, another way to slice this might be, it's not one person, it's two people or three mm -hmm. people, right? You could think about that. Um, and you could even, you know, you don't want to be careful about this in terms of your company culture, but you could hire two or three and almost make them compete, you know, like mm -hmm. overlapping fields of authority and just see who kind of shakes out, right? Um, right. That kind of stuff. I, I don't think um, this is a very engineer way to do it. If you take the question literally, where's your COO? That's one thing. That's not what they're asking. They're okay. asking, how are you going to grow this if you're not the growth guy? So I that's see. your question. Mohammed. Like, how do I how do I show investors that I have the team that can do, you know, take all this cool stuff that's in my head out into the world? And is it maybe you need, uh, you know, uh, a director of sales and a director of ops and a director of HR or something. Mm -hmm. and I kinda, if you had those three, they yeah. probably wouldn't be asking about the COO, right? Because they see that you have people who can operate, right? right? That's right. what they're asking is who's going to operate this thing? Operate this. Yeah. Make, makes sense. Thank you so much for the answer. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Appreciate it. Cool. Well, good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, like thanks for being here. Um, be sure to like and thumbs up and all that stuff. And I'm in Simi Valley, by the way. So I have attended a couple of OC uh meetings that you right. guys so. that's right excellent well good to see you i'm hoping to have one next month but my travel schedule i don't know <laughs> right good to see you great okay well everybody's rocking along here it's 123 already we're gonna try a pitch now um let me find troy's thing yeah troy okay let's bring troy on and then i'm gonna go through the chat room uh a lot of you are being patient um, well, let me hit a couple of those, Troy. Sorry to delay this one more sec. One more second. Uh, Zach asked, where do we find this uh, mail to send our questions? Sorry, wrong button. This one. Come on. Okay, how do you submit questions? Um, it's not an email, it's a form. So you in if you RSVP on Eventbrite, or through all the meetup listings, depending on where you saw this, or LinkedIn, you have to read the event listing. And there's a link that's a RSVP link. And there, there is a form to send in um, things like this. So read the full listing. Don't just RSVP, go and read it and click on the link. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, Kieran asked how to sign up for the paid mentorship. Uh, I guess you mean the private coaching calls? That's literally 
privatecoachingcalls.com. That's how long I've been doing this, privatecoachingcalls.com. Um, I'll put it in here even. Let's see. Coaching. I should show up in the uh, private coaching calls. Okay. So those are um, some general questions. And let's go back to Troy. Troy, Troy, Troy. Okay. Troy. There he is. The most patient man in the world from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> not what we're certainly not what we're known for. <laughs> right, that's right. Cool. All right. Well, nice to meet you. Thank you for your patience. Um, yeah. So Troy RSVP that he wanted to practice his pitch. So when we do this, usually I'm telling everybody and you, Troy, uh, if this sounds useful to you, um, do like a one or two minute, just verbal, no slides, right? Just kind of get it out there for practice, and then I and everybody in the chat room will try to give you some helpful feedback. Um, Excellent. That's kind of all there is to it. So yeah. uh, you want to give that a shot? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so, so hey, everybody, my name is Troy Fink, and I am a, the CEO and co-founder of Gamut Tech. And Gamut Tech is a for-parent, by-parent company that helps mom and dads solve for problems that they face every day raising little ones. Uh, our flagship product is the PP1. And the PP1 is a little piece of hardware tech that lives on the toilet that we use every day that gamifies the, the toilet training process to help children learn how to use it properly and safely. Uh, around the world, 50% uh, or, or, or more of the world's children are actually potty trained by the age of 12 months. Uh, here in America, we're between 30 at 30 months at the earliest to 36. Uh, at an average monthly expenditure of $80 for diapers per month. Uh, if the PP1 were to even save you one month of time, it promises to not just help you save that one month, but uh, it's keep you back from a really crappy job. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Is that it? Uh, the, 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 mar the market share uh, it, it, for, for children's products, specifically potty training product, it is massive in, in the billions from 2015 to 2020, has raised 10% year over year and then slowed down some uh, since 2020. But uh, in the next few years, is on pace to grow at a 4% rate. Um, right now, we are have proven through uh, a great deal of research and the development to find that gamified learning processes is truly the, the way in which not just to make um, children learn things in a way that has deeper retention, uh, but is brings more positive effects. Um, but purchasing a product from Gamma Tech. Uh, would also help curb um, tons of pollutants. Uh, disposable diapers take a, a massive amount of time to be, become bio, biodegradable and um, re can return you really important time back to, to mom and dad and spending, um, spending that with their children. I'm a father of three. Um, one is 16, uh, Troy Jr. One is two. That's Ezra, and we have one on the way. And uh, being a 36-year-old guy, when Troy Jr. was born, um, my moral compass wasn't quite calibrated the way that fortunately that it is today. And unfortunately, I missed some of those important mile markers in Troy Jr.'s life. Um, since being blessed with Ezra and having that time returned to me, uh, the idea to make this very crucial part of, of his life uh, fun and exciting and good for mom and dad kind of flopped onto me. We have an amazing team at Gamma Tech. Our mechanical engineer had a short stint at SpaceX. Our industrial designer interned at NASA. <laughs> And my electrical engineer has six patents, including for Harley Davidson, was just a chief 
um, engineer for uh, the world's first hydrogen powered airplane out of Moses Lake. Nice. Um, we're excited. We believe in this and we are ready to begin funding. Okay. Nice. Well, I thought that was very good. Uh, interesting product, entertaining. Um, well done. So let me go to the chat room. Everybody, if you have uh, suggestions, um, we're being constructive here. I, I don't have anything really serious to complain about anyway, but <laughs> just be nice. <laughs> and uh, sounded like a, a good job. So if you have suggestions um, for Troy, then please do uh, share them. Um, quick preparatory, prep preparatory question. Is this for sale already? This is not actively for sale. We're working on our beta prototyping. So our, our, our original V1 prototype actuated just a, a, a third of the total features in which the final product mm -hmm. is we're aiming to, to uh, provide to the public. Okay. So we just took a huge bite towards DFM by, pro by prototyping five V2s that actually actuate, that, that actuate the full suite of, of gamified learning rewards. Great. Okay. So, all right. So let me try to give you some feedback then. Um, cool product, interesting and nicely presented. You have a nice friendly way of pitching, which is great. <laughs> and it's hard to teach. So that's good. Um, so I have some specific suggestions, but the general one is very good. Seriously. Very nice. Got it. Um, what you did though, that the major paradigm shift you need is that was a product pitch. I want a business pitch, right? Investors want to know how are you going to make money? What do these things cost? If I put in a dollar, when am I going to get $10 back? Like focus on the business. So everything you said was interesting, but you need to look at it from the investor's point of view. What you sounded like you're doing and every entrepreneur does this. So no, this is no shame in this at all. Everybody I talk to, they, their first pitch is because you're obsessed with the product, right? You want to talk about the product and the features and how cool it is and it changed your life. Investors don't give a shit. No, no pun intended in this case. <laughs> but, you know, it's like I'm, I'm a fiduciary. I'm managing all this money for my limited partners. If I give you $100,000, what am I getting back? When? How much? why and then why see why is like the last almost right so you kind of got to turn it around a little bit and start with just a little more you know we are and i and i would be clear and this is true for everybody as well a one-liner what you do and why it's important would just help frame the issue so something like i'm troy i'm from philly i have the pp1 it's a gamified piece of hardware that i'm guessing because i don't know you didn't say attaches to the toilet to help children track how often they go and lets their parents save time in diapers or something like that. Like just get it out there. And then I have some idea where we're going because otherwise it's a mystery story. Right. And I never know when it's going to end or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let me just ask. So uh, considering the time restraints, mm -hmm. Would it have been appropriate in, let's say, double the amount of time, which was four? I don't. I didn't count how long I was. I think I was probably close to two minutes. Mm -hmm. But if I were to get to that place and then start at minute three and four about investment needs and return, would you consider that to be optimal or you no. want me to inverse? No, you have to invert it. I don't give a shit about anything else until I know what the business is. Understood. It does not matter. It really doesn't to investors, right? You got It's really hard for our entrepreneurs to grasp this, but this yeah. is your life. I don't care, right? I got fifty other business plans on my desk. What do you do? You know, I gotta go, right? Got it. So, yeah. So, um, and it was more like three and a half minutes actually. That was quite long. I let you go. Um, Thanks. So, Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. But you gotta. You're gonna have to compress it more, right? And we want to hear the the business because if it's not the business, if we're not interested. We're not interested, right? So that's yep. you got to get to it. Um, and that's a common thing. So, but it, it really helps to encapsulate it in the one line, you know, like, like a newspaper, right? A headline and then the sub point. Um, so that's one. And then um, again, with the business, um, I'd like to know more. Is it hardware? There must be a software component or maybe not. I don't answer now, but you just, you got to be clear. What is it you're making? We're giving you money to do what? I don't know. 
like I, it's gamified. Okay, what does it hook up to the Nintendo? I, I don't know. Is it a Zoom call? I, I, I don't know. You have to tell me what it is so that I, and part of this is so investors can help you or get excited. Like if you say it's software or say it does work with the Nintendo, it's like, oh, well, I used to be, I used to work at Nintendo. I can help this guy, right? right. Or, or whatever. Like give him, give me something, give the specifics so people can grab on. Otherwise it's kind of vague. Um, and a couple more quick ones. Um, I love the stuff about the cost benefit versus diapers. That's great because that gives an ROI to the, the, the user, the parent. That was very clever. Uh, and getting even more specific on that would be great. Um, investors eat numbers, right? The more numbers you can feed us, the better. Um, so that was cool. And then the little cherry on top of that about the disposability uh, in the landfill and how long it takes things to biodegrade. That was good too, right? That is not as strong as the ROI, but the one, two punch there like this actually, that's cool because you know, every investor likes to think that they're making the world a better place, even if they're just sharks. <laughs> they, like, they, like, they like to think they're making an impact, right? Yeah. Um, I would leave out the stuff about the moral compass that makes you sound like you're not necessarily as trustworthy as you are. Although of course the punchline is that you are, but you don't even need to say it. Just say, you know, I missed, I wasn't around much when my first son was born and I missed it. So I'm back, you know, hey, and it's cool. Um, so, and then, oh, the other thing for the business that you skipped over was, and I, it was my first question, is this actually happening? Is this active or not? And one of the reasons I asked in this context was because if you said they're for sale, I was going to tell everybody what the URL was so they could go buy one, right? <laughs> but, but, um, but we can do that next time. The last point I have is that, this is, sounds like a really good market. And when I got your uh, submission, and again, Troy was one who sent it in early, which is super helpful, um, which you can find if you read the full event listings, um, was, and my concern was, and you got past it, but let me say it anyway, is um, he's targeting a very niche market of little ones. And having three kids myself, I understand exactly how when you have kids, little kids, it seems like everybody has little kids because all your friends have little kids. But the rest of the world doesn't. And that period goes quickly, as you found out in the gap between your first and second. Right. Um, so investors are likely to say something like this is a very time limited market. It's like only targeting first graders. Right. Like, why would you only target first graders? You can market to K through 12. Right. Or something like that. I think you got past it, though, because you made the point um, about you had numbers right about like the size of the market and the fact that it replaces diapers. There's a direct cost trade off. Um, and the uh, landfill thing, like you had some other things, but you might get pushback on that. So you might think about normally my reaction when I read this, as, as I said, was um, I was going to say, you need to think about a follow on product because that's what they're going to ask. It, they may not get there because this may be a big enough market on its own. Good job. But you still might think like, hey, if this works and I have 100,000 you know, parents of uh, two year olds, what else can I do? Right. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Right. Um, and you wouldn't hit that too hard, but you probably want to have an answer for that, because if you've gotten good at this, an investor is going to say, well, OK, what else you got? Right. And then you might say, well, actually, I've been waiting to tell you we got this. Well, it's funny because our flagship product is also our only product. <laughs> okay, well, I got you then. I got you. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Hey, th thanks so much. Can I just leave? Can I offer a ask a question as well? Sure. Okay. Uh, just thoughts, and I have to log off because I have a meeting. But I want to. I want to mm. listen. Thoughts on crowdfunding options um, it, as for a product like this. Yeah. Um, this is like a, a milestone that everyone has to pass through to get potty trained. So. Um, Though it's a niche, it's also universal. So I just wondered your thoughts in terms of that sort of funding strategy. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. You're welcome. I think it's a good idea. Um, um, I also liked, you reminded me, I meant to say, I liked the statistic about the um, foreign countries, right? That we, we take way too long in the US. <laughs> that's, that's a good one because it gives people some reference that this is solvable, right? It gives it it's social proof, uh, which I think is very interesting. Um, and um, you can catch this later, Troy, if you have to go, this will be on the replay on YouTube. Um, sorry, I'm looking for this other link here uh, about crowdfunding. There we go. Um, so yes, I think crowdfunding could be a good option for this because it has such large consumer appeal. And crowdfunding is great because you can get great valuations, right? You could value the company at $10 million and most retail investors don't know the difference between 10 million and 1 million in a, in a startup valuation. It could be a very good deal for you. Um, I brought up this URL because this lists, as I said earlier, this lists places where I invest, but it also lists several crowdfunding platforms. And I have referral links on there because I have relationships with WeFunder and Republic 
and Start Engine. I'm an investor in several of those companies, in fact. Um, and if you use the links, I think you get free fees or something. I don't think I get it. It's an affiliate sort of thing, but I don't think I get anything. I think it's you. You get like your listing fees are um, canceled or something. I haven't done it lately, but those links are on there and they because they have a referral that says Scott Fox or Startup Council or something. So anyway, Troy or anybody else that's interested in crowdfunding, you might look at those links. Um, so yes, I think crowdfunding could be good for you. The trick with crowdfunding, the quick version, and then I'm going to hit everybody in the chat before we run out of time. Uh, the quick thing with crowdfunding is that it's really, um, it's to market to people who you know already. It's more than it is. The dream of crowdfunding is that you don't know anyone, you put it up there and then everybody discovers you and wants to invest. That can happen. And the crowdfunding platforms will try to help, but it's way better, way better. If you already have an audience who needs a way to invest and you do what uh, my friends at WeFunder called a um, community round, you already have the community and like, like Troy or anybody in his situation, you should have a website up that's building an email list, taking interest in people, taking email addresses who may have interest in this product, right? And if you could go to WeFunder and put up a campaign there and already have 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 people that say, I want to hear when this launches, bang, that's how you get a WeFunder campaign or a, a Start Engine or Republic or whatever it is, um, campaign launched. When you already have an audience, you give them a way to show up and support. It's not so much to find people to support, if that helps. Okay, sorry guys, I got a cough. <coughs> Woo. I'm killing myself for you guys today. <laughs> anyway, no, I enjoy doing this. Thank you everybody for coming. All right, so let's hit the chat room. And then we'll wrap up here. I'm sorry, I don't have time to take any more uh, on the air uh, questions, but I do see in the backstage chat, let me try to, um, Philippe and Kagate have been here for a long time. So let me just review what they were saying and then I will review. Um, Kirk, a fundraising question. I was able to file my patent cooperation treaty paper some time back, but I'm trying to raise money for the initial country filings, but as old get working. So I don't have, I'm worried I will miss out on overseas protections. Um, yeah, so what Kirk is talking about there is intellectual property question. When you file patents in the United States, that's good, but it doesn't protect you in foreign countries. That's also desirable. It's potentially unlimited, though. Um, there are not patents. It's co it costs money, right? So if you're going to file in even the top 10 countries, much less 150 others, it's going to cost you a fortune. Um, Kirk, Kirk I, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer. I've never done that. I would talk to a good patent counsel. I can refer you to somebody if you'd like. Of course, their answer is going to be you need to file in some of them. So it's going to cost you some money. I think I would try to do some research. Uh, Google could be your friend here. And just Google that honest question. Do I really need to file patents in every country in the world? And see what other people say. There's probably a Reddit group or something that would discuss this. Um, you know, China might rip you off no matter what you do. So... You know, I don't know that a patent filing is going to help you against that anyway. Uh, and they're the biggest manufacturer of ripoff products. I forget what you actually do. So it may, some people say patents aren't even worth it, right? So there's a lot of pros and cons there. Um, I would do some research. I'm sorry, I don't have a better uh, answer for you. Um, uh, Eric agreed with the advice. Oh, about, this must be about David's um, deck design. He agrees uh, deck overhaul cost him about $500, but it was worth every penny. So yeah, a few hundred bucks or a thousand bucks and you can make your uh, deck look attractive and you have to, to keep up with the neighbors these days. Uh, Slidebean.com, Tori suggested that as a place to look at uh, beautiful pitch decks. Uh, Randy says, thank you. Nazim says, thank you. Philippe, this is the one I wanted to get to. Hey, we're doing a pre-seed with a safe agreement, but some investors ask me, what is the equity percent? What do you say? <laughs> Philippe. Um, Philippe says, uh, sorry. So he wants to know what percentage do investors get when you do a safe? You don't know. That's the point of a safe. A safe is a simple agreement for future equity. It's a standard deal kind of template that is used for really early stage companies when it's a standard agreement for future equity. You don't know what the equity is worth yet. So you are agreeing that you're going to take their money, say it's a hundred thousand dollars, but you don't assign a valuation of the company. You don't say the company's worth a million. Therefore, you get a hundred of that. It's not quite 10% because there's whatever, pre and post money, whatever. But um, you're assigning, you're agreeing that later when other people come in, say like a venture round comes in with say $3 million, 
and your 100 will convert then into that future. So there is not a percentage that you can offer. That is the point of a safe. You don't really know yet. Follow-ups. One is don't pre-money safe. Investors hate those. Those have been superseded by a post-money safe. That will help you um, get closer uh, to what investors want. Also, you can put a valuation cap on your safe, meaning that it will be no more than $5 million or something like that. And that gives you an approximate uh, top side of that can help you back into a percentage ownership. I hope that's helpful. And you, again, you can, um, uh, that can help you answer this. Hold on, I'm just reading. Yeah, Philippe says, I don't see percent equity with a Y Combinator safe agreement. Correct. You can't. That's the point. Safe agreements don't have an equity percentage. You need a different kind of agreement. You need a convertible note, probably. Right. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> uh, see, um, so what if the investors want equity? Oh, you're still here, Philippe. Sorry, I could have brought you on. I didn't realize you were still here. Okay, real quickly. Here comes. Well, you have to turn your camera on. Okay, I think we're out of time, Philippe. I would have brought you on. Anyway, um, uh, what, what if the per investors want equity? You need a post. Sorry, you need a convertible note or you need to actually issue them equity. It's a different thing. Um, they both get the same place with investors giving you money and you give them a piece of the company. But if they want a known percentage, you can't do that with a safe. That's the point of a safe. You're agreeing that it's unknown and you agree later. Kagate says, um, because of post COVID, do investors typically expect startup to have a certain number of users and revenue before they consider investing? At what stage startup should go for fundraising? Um, there's no hard answer to that, uh, Kagate. Um, Investors want to see traction, and we've talked about that a bunch this hour. Um, it's really about demonstrating some kind of growth, that you have momentum, that you've convinced someone outside yourself and your immediate family that this is a thing. Ideally, those are team members, and even better as customers. They want to see some sort of momentum. Uh, there's no hard number. More is better. And the more you have, the better valuation and more money you'll be able to raise. Sorry, not a binary answer. Okay, I'm gonna run through the chat here and um, if I don't lose my voice. Da, da, da. Thank you all the way, all, by the way, for everybody for coming. I enjoy doing this. I hope you're enjoying it too. Please do like and sponsor this, uh, not sponsor, well, you can sponsor too. <laughs> I meant uh, like and what? Subscribe, that's the one, subscribe. Like and subscribe. And we're looking for sponsors, by the way. Yeah, I do all this for free. Um, we use the money to pay the assistants that run the startup council and stuff. Um, this is a essentially a nonprofit. If you'd like to sponsor, that'd be awesome. The other way you could pay us back is liking, subscribing, telling your friends, coming again, coming to our events, um, using some of these uh, low cost services that we're putting up. Like I talked about, you can join the Startup Council for free and then you get discounts on these guys. Would love your support because uh, I'm working hard to support you. All right, we're gonna run through the chat. We got about uh, 10 minutes here. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, Okay, DC, oh, come on now, scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, India, I did that. Uh, yeah, we did that one from Zach. Um, Kieran, we talked about the top three things you look for. And I did that earlier. If you're watching the video replay, you can wind that back and see that. What's the best way to get found and find angel investors for a biotech food startup? Okay, Benjamin. Yeah, good question there. Um, best way, well, there's a lot of organizations. I would look, it depends a lot on where you are geographically. Here in Southern California, there's one called the, oh, that's what's it called, Biotech LA or Bio Council. I don't know. I would Google around join associations, get on their mailing list, and then go to their events, their virtual events, and meet people. There's no way to substitute really other than to go out and meet people, even if it's virtual. Or actually, thank you for the setup. Um, that's why I built this. I'm trying to get you guys all in one place. And if you all are there, then investors will show up. I promise you they will. If there are deals to be had, investors show up. Uh, capital is the most mobile thing in the world. So come list here. There's a deal, um, NSD beta or beta NSD, I had that up earlier, I'll put it back up. Um, you can go and put up your uh, your startup there and there's not a lot there, this is a new site, there it is. Um, we're just getting going, but if you wanna join and get a uh, good deal, I think it might even be free for a year, something like that. Um, but it's cheap, low cost, even when it's paid and we're trying to get everybody in one place. 
Okay, so that was that. And then moving through here, uh, Scott from Alice. We did that, okay. So Aaron says, my company's main purpose is raising funds through judgment acquisitions. Doesn't seem like it's very sustainable in my specific niche. How do you evaluate when it's ready to pivot? I don't know anything about that niche, Aaron. It sounds interesting, but um, when it's ready to pivot is when you're spinning your wheels, when you've talked to people enough and you're not getting the feedback you want. It's it's a hard feeling, especially if you've spent a lot of time in it. Um, I've had failures like that, some big, some small. And when the enthusiasm that you're putting out in the world is not being rewarded, it's time. Um, the other piece, uh, my dad gave me good advice about this when I folded my first company after years of heartache and enthusiasm, was that you, you need to feel like you've given it a good shot, right? You have to feel like you gave it your full effort. Otherwise, you'll regret and you'll think you missed out. So give it a full shot, whatever that means. Don't go crazy. You know, don't mortgage your house and lose your home, but give it a full effort. Give yourself some goals and a timeline. If it doesn't work out by this time and I really did all I could, then it's time to, to pivot or even move on and shut it down. You got to give yourself a little discipline. Um, your dream may not come true. There may be other dreams that you can have, right? Um, one of my mentors said one time, um, uh, if you want to buy new furniture, you got to get rid of the old furniture, <laughs> right? So clean out the room and new things can then arrive. Uh, who is my responder again? I'm not sure what that means. Veneman, sorry. Uh, Shantanu, how tricky is it to do inside sales forum India for North America? Any recommendations on establishing trust? Um, Shantanu, that's not a thing I have a great uh, familiarity with. Um, let me think though. Uh, well, it can be difficult, right? Um, a couple easy keys are that uh, Americans are very parochial. We're not used to people that have funny accents. So make sure your people speak as good an English from an American point of view. Like if they can, the more they sound like Americans, the easier it will be for you. Um, also, I hate to say it and it almost sounds racist, but if you have long, complicated names by American standards, like Shantanu is perfectly easy to say. I don't know why Americans would have trouble with that, but they might. So you might try Sean, right? I mean, just these are facts, unfortunately. Um, so if you're trying to do inside sales in America, those would be two um, so that people will, you know, understand you and treat you better. That's just the way Americans are. I apologize on behalf of my country. Um, uh, and then um, if you're talking about hiring people who are American, maybe that's what you mean by inside sales, then that's expensive, right? So you're probably talking about from India. Um, there's a great company that does this. A friend of mine runs a company called beyondcodes.com, Gaurav. Um, and they've been very successful at that. Maybe that would be helpful you to look at that. Um, I don't know much more than that. Um, Athena, I said hi to you. Hello. Um, Berlin, Germany, Mohammed. Um, Okay, excellent. Hello. My LinkedIn again, Dama. I think I did that again. Uh, I'm Scott Fox author is my handle on LinkedIn. Michael uh, says, uh, I'm building a social network and won't get the revenue for nine to 12 months. I'm looking to raise capital for employees and server costs. Will investors understand and see the potential for future revenue? No, I don't think so. Uh, unfortunately, um, that's a, sounds great. I'm sure you're brilliant, but I do this show cause I try to be honest. And I think the answer is no, that kind of model. That's my space from 15 years ago. Um, there are a lot of social networks now. If you can, it would be like this I'm trying to be encouraging here. Um, I would rethink your business plan full stop. But if you are convinced, then you need to demonstrate traction and growth. So how many people can you recruit? Uh, what kind of engagement metrics can you demonstrate? Are there advertisers or sponsors that would pay for that? Because social networks are usually free, remember? And per the discussion I had a few minutes ago with Troy, you need to talk about your business, not your product, right? Investors want to know how you're going to make money. And social networks are famous for not making money. So unless you've figured out a way to crack that, you're going to face a tough audience. Ideally, I would think you'd probably want to find a specific niche where you have demonstrated expertise or connections. So you're gonna build the best social network for truck drivers or orthodontists or 
you know, whatever, you know, some niche and ideally people that have money that need to connect that are going to attract advertisers and sponsors. Uh, if you can't demonstrate a business case for this, I'm not sure how far you're going to get. Sorry. Um, let's see. Mohammed from Berlin says, oh, we can put this one on the, I forgot we can put these on the screen. Here it comes. I am a uh, founder for an autonomous vehicle tech startup. What are angel investors mainly looking for? Okay, well, I already kind of covered that. Um, sorry, Mohammed. hopefully you caught that. Um, you got to look investable. And that's a combination of uh, team and um, market opportunity and uh, go-to-market strategy and traction. It's a whole combination of things. It's not an easy checklist. Sorry, I'm going quickly here. Re-upcycle. How can we show, how can we secure funding to drive its pioneering mission forward and simultaneously establish the vital infrastructure needed for its eco-friendly L3C startup. Um, okay, well, um, one quick tip is, I, I don't know what an L3C startup is, so you need to not use jargon. Um, uh, pine, eco-friendly, I guess it's some level three something. Um, you want to yeah, I, sorry, I, I don't know, re-upcycle, that gives me a clue. I guess you're a recycling organization, sounds great. Um, I think the answer is the same. You got to look like a business. Uh, your mission is fantastic, I'm sure it is, but investors don't care about that. First, they care about how is it going to make the money. So you might be able to find what they call impact investors. Impact investors are those who do more charitably driven, uh, social impact making ventures. Um, but even then, they need to make a return on their capital. It may not have to be an Uber, like I was joking about earlier, with a you know, hundred or a thousand times on your money, but they still need money. So I would rethink your approach and think about how are they going to get a return on that mission. They may want to help you, but if it's not going to make money, you shouldn't be looking for investors. You should be looking for grants and foundations who will support you uh, in your mission. Him, him, Shika from Kathmandu. Cool. We've never had a Kathmandu person, I don't think. So thanks for tuning in. Um, please hit, oh, here's Zach. Thank you, Zach is back. Please hit the likes. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. And then uh, the investors directory I showed, it's startupinvestorsdirectory.com. Startupinvestorsdirectory.com. Uh, how or who can evaluate my company? Well, we can do that kind of thing here during the show if you want to do the quick pitch like Troy did, or you could book a private call with me, like I said earlier. Those cost money, though, so I'm not pitching that. The best way is to find incubators and accelerators and mentors in your area. Benjamin, um, we have a category for that on Startup Investors Directory. Um, not too many listings there yet because that site is new as well, but you could certainly go look there. Um, I should point that out. This is... Um, the basic search on this is free. Just go look around, right? And then if you want the details, uh, you can pay a little bit to get you know, like the real detailed search, right? But um, that might be helpful to you guys. Alice is back. Um, to what extent do you believe that UI UX for digital products can affect the success of the product itself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a softball, right? Or you must be a UX designer. <laughs> of course. Yes, absolutely. I have a background in UX, UI myself. Uh, there's a major Fortune 500 company that I helped design for years, helped start their whole uh, online presence years ago and um, did some work with the Nielsen Norman Group and stuff like that to optimize that. Absolutely. No doubt. Everybody who's not paying attention to your UI, I would put this in the same category as what David Gerber was talking about earlier in terms of your pitch deck needs to be pretty. Well, so does your website. And more importantly, it needs to work. And that's where I have trouble, Alice, with a lot of designers is they want it to be pretty. And that doesn't matter as much as it working and making it easy for customers to find things. So everybody that has not had a third party look at your website, and by a third party, I mean even your brother-in-law, like doesn't have to be somebody you hire, stand over their shoulder and have them click through your website. You'll be surprised the crazy things they do that you didn't expect. So all in favor of UX UI. Okay, uh, I answered you asked that again. Good, still a good question there. Uh, I still don't know what an L3C startup is. Um, let's see. So, Sean, with that said, I'm not sure what he said, I must have missed that. But should I invest time into building a demo and getting early users before getting a finance person invest in your idea? Well, you have to do both at the same time, Sean. Uh, sorry, that's the, the challenge. You need to build a demo. In fact, you don't need to build a demo. I don't care about a demo, build a product and get early users. 
that that's before I, getting a finance person to me that means hiring someone to do finance that's not something you would do anyway maybe you mean investors um no investor is going to invest in an idea anymore it just it just doesn't happen guys uh, at least in my world i mean if you can find it working somewhere else awesome <laughs> happy to be wrong um scuttlebot oh my friend uh, from long beach okay nice to see you glad you could make it um I find mentor being a key. How do you go about finding a startup mentor? Karen, yeah, that's a great question. This, I would go to events. Again, I would go to events and find people that are interested in your space. This can be geographical, of course. So you should go on Meetup and attend those things. And it can also be virtual. There's another, uh, another, yes, I have another website I didn't even mention. Let me find that one and put that up. This is for you guys in general. This is yet another website we built to help you. This is a free listing of virtual startup events, startupevents.org, startupevents.org lists. It's the only listing in the world that I know of anyway, that lists events for founders that are virtual. So if you live in India or you live in Kansas or you live in Canada or Botswana, you can tune in without having to move to San Francisco or New York or London or Mumbai. You can tune in virtually. So go, um, Kieran, go sign up on this list and you'll get uh, invitations. Uh, it's a calendar and things you can go and attend. And I don't, they're not all free. They're free and paid. They're whatever that we can find, right? But they're four founders and they're virtual. So anybody can attend from anywhere, trying to level the playing field here. And then you can attend and meet people who might be mentors. That's the point. Meet people that might be mentors. Okay. Um, what do we got here? Dr. Nick Riviera, which are the best partners for a startup founder? I am a CS student, but from the EU. However, I'd like to start the company in the US. Internet FinTech, AI. Wow, good stuff there, Nick. Um, yeah, if you're a doctor in AI FinTech software, nice. <laughs> good stuff. Um, well, it sounds like you need somebody that does what you can't. The best founders to find are, are co founders. Uh, or partners, like I said, they're not necessarily co-founders. You just want to build a team that complements itself in terms of other skills. So whose skills complement yours? That's what you need to find. So I'm guessing you're probably not an operations person or a salesperson. Maybe you're more the engineering person. So that's what you need, ops and sales or finance or um, somebody who has relationships in that customer space. Or product development actually might be a good one. Like if you're more engineering and you need a product person to get the thing moving. Yeah, you probably need all of those. Of course, that's the challenge. But um, there are some great programs out there. Um, the one I like best, maybe somebody can put it in the chat room. The best one I found is co-founders something or other. And it's run by Y Combinator. And you can post a profile of yourself and it will match you. It's kind of a free matching service and it will email you new people and when people match you and people can find it's kind of a directory i was going to build one that's why i found it but they've done this already and um i can't remember what it's called though sorry but you could google that y combinator co-founders service and it's out there um and um dama says can i pitch fundraising for a charity um sorry dama no this is not a charity show this i do this show this is a charity um, I'm fully in favor of charities and uh, give as much as I, the profits from my books. I'll go to charity, for example. Um, that's not what we're doing here, though. Sorry. Um, Lee, this is a business show. I need help with equity agreement for my software start. Better find a lawyer's experience. Yes. Oh, God, yes. Lee, do not hire your uncle who does divorce law or your cousin who does car accident law. Um, employment law is a thing and software is its own thing. You need a real lawyer. And they are expensive. Sorry. But you, yes, 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 yes. That's what you need. We can refer you if you need one, right? If you have a real company, send us an email and we'll help you find somebody. Um, see, Alice was, oh, Alice was looking for clients. Okay. All right. Well, she asked some good questions. So if you want to go find Alice, she's looking for projects her company can work on. Okay. All right. Sean says, a lot of people say what you need is an unfair advantage. Is this what people in VC and Angel call an unfair advantage? I'm not sure what you're referring to, Sean, but yes, an unfair advantage. Uh, I would call that, um, well, anything that makes it better for you that the other guy doesn't have. It's a competitive world, right? So if you're playing basketball and you're eight feet tall, 
<laughs> more power to you, right? Uh, in this case, it means like having um, a line on some really good customers. For example, a lot of companies, uh, startup companies are started because someone has expertise in an industry and they saw a hole in the market and they know those customers. So they leave their old company and they start a new company that does that, solves that problem. That's an unfair advantage. Uh, if you have a bunch of money, that's always an unfair advantage, any of that kind of stuff. Yes. And you should look for that because that's really what can differentiate you. What's your unfair advantage? Do you, this is a good one, Kieran. Do you bake founder salary into the funding ask? If not, how can a founder make this their full-time job until the company starts generating revenue to pay for operation costs? Yeah, you have to bake your own salary in there. But honestly, founders would rather see you doing this for free. I'm not founders, investors. Investors, we don't want to just pay you to do something you want to do anyway, right? I don't want to pay you so that you can pay your rent. That's not very interesting, right? Why would I want to do that? It's much better. You're in a much stronger position with investors. If you can say, I'm taking no salary. I've, you know, I've skipped $50,000 worth of salary, you know, um, or even better. Um, that doesn't quite work as well as it should. I think, I don't think it's fair, but investors would like it even better. If you say, I took $50,000 and I put it into the company and I have then drawn against that kind of thing, right? I'm not sure why, but that seems to sound better to people. But yeah, we want to see that you've got skin in the game. The idea is not to take my money and use it for your expenses. I'll keep that money and use it for my expenses, right? So um, yeah, you, but you need to build some salary in. If you need to do that, you need to do it. That's how it is, right? So yes, tell the truth here. There's no hiding the ball. Um, tell the truth, but you got to make it reasonable, right? A couple grand a month, three thousand a month, you know, in the states um, or less if you're in a cheaper climate. Um, yeah, and even at uh, last um, venture-backed startup I worked at, I guess I shouldn't get too specific, but yeah, they paid me like half of my, less than half of my salary when I was at a uh, at a Fortune 500 company, right? Less than half, plus um, no bonuses and stuff. But I had a huge chunk of stock, right? So it's a different thing. Even founders, even at big, fairly successful, like um, like Series A sort of companies or Series B that are well-funded, they still, at least in the States, often get paid like only $150,000 or $200,000 a year or something, which would, may sound like a lot of money to some of you in other uh, economic environments, but is less than a senior executive would normally make, way less. Um, but they do that. They're just covering their mortgage and expenses and, uh, and their household, you know, and they're making the rest on the stock. Um, let's see what else we got here. Okay. Yeah. With Nazim, Nazim asked that. Yep. And he agrees and he's a CPA. <laughs> um, yes. Um, here we go. Chi. Yes. We do the masterminds. Uh, I don't have the masterminds thing around. Anyway, yes, I run masterminds. Well, actually, there's two. Go to mastermindsoc.org. I don't promote that much because we do them mostly locally. All of you, let me back up. All of you should go to the startupcouncil.org and get on our email lists, okay? Go do that. We will tell you everything. All the stuff I'm talking about, if you just get on this email list, you get everything. Um, but yes, G, um, masterminds, I try to do this once a month. And I'd alternate them. I used to do them in person, but then we had a pandemic. Now I do them once a month online. And then once a month here in the local area. And I'm going to probably try to do one in early September before I leave for Australia, but it might end up online. I'm not sure. But anyway, mastermindsoc.org. What is, is it okay to have two engineers start a business? Sure. Mark, yeah, you can start with whoever you want. Um, engineers don't, sorry, investors don't care who they are as long as they're good and they're playing a valuable role. There's no specific criteria. Again, this is not black and white binary stuff, right? If the two of you work well together and you trust each other, of course, yeah. But you're going to need some other people, right? So the problem with two investors, as it is with six, sorry, two founders, as it is with six founders, is you got to split all the equity, right? So if the two, if there's room for two of you to each take a big chunk and still have enough equity for the rest of the team and for the investors, that's your issue, right? So um, you're probably going to need someone with more of a business background. Yeah, that's going to happen. It's a business, right? This is not a product development exercise. Um, 
Let's see. This is an interesting one. Phyllis. Do American angels invest in publishing books or going? Um, no, Phyllis, I don't think so. Um, angel investors, at least, well, I'm mostly a tech guy, right? So big qualification for all this advice is really based on the tech world because tech has become, because it can grow so fast. Like we talked about software can replace people and just grow so fast. So um, books and publishing are not software or biotech, right? Those are the hottest areas. Um, so I, I don't think so. Where it might become venture investable is if you can create a whole series of courses or trainings and build a company around a specific niche of expertise. And then that can scale globally through YouTube and stuff like that. Um, but that's not a common thing. Um, okay. Uh, Alice, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to skip your other questions. Uh, we're really over time here. Sean says, is, am I long or short crypto? I'm long crypto. I have been for a long time. Um, let's see. Um, Larry, do you need a warm introduction to get in front of Tech Coast Angels? No, definitely not. You can apply on the website. You can use my name if you want. That might help a little bit. You should go to that startup funding page I have. Uh, that will give you several places that um, you can go. Um, you do not need a warm introduction. And, and, and in fact, that's less common than it used to be. Of course, it always helps. We are actually actively adding people that don't need warm introductions to this list. So um, even if you don't join this service today, all of you should join it in the next few months. We're adding new people daily. It's growing. There's over 3,000 investors there now, and they're growing quickly. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. How can I sign up for the paid membership session? That's uh, privatecoachingcalls.com. Athena, what do you uh, think of following up on sales folks on equity? Um, well, Cake Equity can help you by running the administration of it. Cake is awesome in the terms of they make it really easy to offer stock grants and track them and include the vesting and the legal terms and all that. It's all in there. So it can definitely help you make stock option grants. Whether you can hire sales folks on equity is a different question. Athena, in my experience, good salespeople won't work for equity. They want cash. But if you can find one and they'll do it, awesome. <laughs> and yes, then I would use um, then I would use cake to track it. Um, okay. I'm gonna have to skip through these folks. We're over time and I'm, um, losing my voice as you could say, okay. This is interesting. Mark, um, is it a good strategy to start a product using crowdfunding and then switch to VC Angel? Uh, historically, no. Something that goes as public as uh, crowdfunding is generally not seen. Uh, angels and VCs usually like to be in earlier than that and have more participation and control. A couple things have changed. Crowdfunding is more active now. Um, if you ask the crowdfunding platforms, they will swear to you that VCs and angels are actually using the crowdfunding crowdfunding platforms to find deals, um, which is a positive development in the sense of transparency and access to capital. Uh, the main thing I would be careful about, though, is that crowdfunding, like I mentioned earlier, crowdfunding rounds tend to be done at valuations that aren't necessarily market realistic, because the whole nature of a crowdfunding is that the company says, we're worth this. If you want to, if you want a piece, come join us at this level. And people either join or they don't, right? So everybody, that, there's no negotiation of the price is what I'm saying. VCs and angels, we want to be involved in the price setting. And if um, you do a crowdfunding round, you already have a bunch of people invested probably at a fairly high price. And then if you do an angel or VC round, we're likely to force the price down. And then you go back to all your initial investors and say, sorry, you know, we were just kidding. And it's really, really awkward. <laughs> so I would avoid that. Um, I would rather try to um, do one or the other, or at least be clear about which path you were, you were after. It's a longer discussion, but there's a lot of information about that. And like I said, there are um, referrals to some of the crowdfunding platforms on my um, startup funding uh, 
Oh, crap. I hit the wrong button. I guess that means the show's about over. <laughs> so let's turn off the chat overlay. I think we're about done here. Let me just, I'll hit a couple more. Um, okay, here's my LinkedIn. If you missed it, um, I was looking for this one. There it is. So this is the one that has all the more specific answers. This is where the angel groups I'm involved in, you can find those links. You can find the crowdfunding info. You can find my private coaching calls uh, link. And if any of that is helpful to you, I think the masterminds um, link is on there as well. And all of these, you can reach us. You're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. Like I said, although please say who you are and why we're connecting. And really the real answer here is, <laughs> I can't find it. There, okay, there. Um, really, just go there, and you can you can see all the stuff you need to see. And let me just run through these last few um, chat questions. Man, two fifteen here already. Okay. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. Okay. Seems I need some rest. Thank you for your good wishes. Um, Okay, Christian, it sounds like your computer died. Sorry, go watch on YouTube the re the re uh, the replay, um, and uh, yeah. Okay, let me. Uh, oh, you filed a patent. Congratulations. Um, okay, so let me just say this, and this will be our final note for those of you who are software developers. It looks like Christian or Mark are there. Uh, Christian's comment, I think, is the right one. I think a lot of founders, especially in the software domain, work on a side project for years, refining it, trying to market it on their own dime while being employed by another company. Yes, that's true. It's the wrong way to do it, guys. You you just cannot do this like a movie, right? A movie, people think this is the way to do it somehow. You build, you make a movie and then, you know, it's coming June 1st, the movie, the movie's coming Friday night box office. Wow, huge box office, yay. Everybody's glad to see the movie. Investment doesn't work like that. If you're building something, you need to be building your relationships as well so that when it's ready, you already have people who know, like, and trust you who will invest. If you expect that you're going to unveil your software project like a movie with a big premiere and then investors are going to show up, it's not going to happen. Again, I'm, I try to be encouraging. That's why I do the show. I'm an optimist, but you're hurting yourself. I know you're a software guy and you want to just sit at the keyboard, but that's not how this works. You need, to, if you want to get funded, I mean, if you can build it on your own and fund it and take it to market and generate revenue, way cool, awesome, right? But then you're running on revenue. You don't even need investors, right? That's way better. Nobody should take investment money unless they need it, right? But if you've painted yourself into a corner by working on your own and not taking salary, you're in trouble, right? So you, you got to branch out immediately and make some friends find an incubator, an accelerator, go to events, find people like me who are interested and will give you the time to help introduce you and teach you this stuff and watch like all my YouTube videos, right? There's like 200 of them out there for years. Read my books. Like I'm trying to help, but I can't help all of you individually. You got to branch out. You can't just develop something and expect somebody to fund it. I don't know how else to say it. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish that was different. So um, get out there, make some friends. All right. I got to stop. <laughs> Okay. So thank you all for coming. Please hit like and subscribe, follow, tell your friends. We'll be back again next month. Actually, next month I'm traveling. I might have to move that date. Okay. But we'll come sometime again soon. Get on this list, startupcouncil.org. This is the clearinghouse for all the stuff I've talked about. Come and join the party. Help me help you. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I hope it was helpful for you. If it was, please leave a comment. You know, comments are even better um, than likes, right? So please comment on YouTube or um, LinkedIn, especially that would drive more adoption and followers and all that social media nonsense. So thanks for being here. Go out there. You can do this. You can do this. I'm going to go have lunch. Thanks. <laughs>